still do wrist stretches, even on days where we are not playing Squid Game. Because wrist stretches are important regardless. A lot, doing a lot of typing, doing a lot of mouse movement. That's a little bit more precise than I'm used to. <clears throat> okay. Um, so did that on Twitter, did that on, uh, yeah, okay, I think we're good to go. <clears throat> so, hello, Lois Hior. I, I think that's how I'm going to pronounce that. I'd let me know if I'm wrong. And hello, Chaluna and G Chang. Oh, shoot, that is the wrong place for that audio to be coming. There, that should be fixed. You guys probably actually heard the Wumi like uh, echoed there for a second. Probably came through my mic. Okay, fixed that up anyway. Hello, G Chang, and hello, Bixbite, and Weege, and Minty Misk, and Z Tech. Yep, I don't even have Splatoon turned on right now. And hello, Squirtle Dude, and The King 3, and JR Hyde, and Phydro, and Kane. Picked up my first charger after watching your videos. Awesome! Good luck with that. Uh, practice your aim. That's that's that part's important. And hello, target overboard and get get cool. Can you type out every word in the dictionary? Yes, but I won't. Uh, it takes too long. And hello, Corvus, and Igor, and Prif. Are you covering explaining how everything in Splatoon is a fish pun? Probably not today. Maybe maybe next time. Uh, and hello, Shadow Sage. Uh, wanted to say as a Splatoon one that I enjoy your TikToks and shorts. Thank you. And hello, Skog Vetter and Farmer Joe Toe. And shape-shifting cephalopod and mud eye and Aurelian and Corvus and Space Dog 363. Mouse is broken, so I have to spam the tab button. Oh my god. That's that's a level of dedication that I would not have to using my computer. Uh, goodness. Um and hello to Zuri Zuri Zero and Neogenesis and Manta Rea. Or Manta Ray, okay, I see I see. Rhea? Or Ray. Probably Rhea, I would think. But that's cool. I like that. Um, and hello, Temsa. And Yeyito Kun. And Target Overboard. And Gons. New Splatoon 3 syntax season looking fine. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, and hello, Star Shower Espoir. Existing outside while waiting to move a desk. <laughs> Moving do be like that. And hello, Apollo. And Lady Tay is a professional manuscript editor. I'm unironically excited about this supplementary lesson. Awesome. Uh, and hello, Chloe. Is this going in the test? Uh, see, here's the thing. I I can't. I'm the, the the test is life for this one. Raya. There we go. Perfect. And hello, Falcon Punch Twenty Five and Dead Shots. Have used this a few days ago. AP Lang exam. Oh no. Am, am, I, am I getting in too late? Am I getting in too late for people? Shoot. <laughs> oh no. And hello, the Splunker. Thanks for the short squid surges video, I, tr I trust. I never knew you could mash the jump button to swim faster. Oh yeah, that's something it doesn't really tutorialize in the game, does it? It's something that'd be, It's very easy for people to just never learn. Even though, I think that's something that's tutorialized in Splatoon 2? but not in Splatoon 3, because it was much more common knowledge there, I feel. Um, and hello, Champ Josh. Some great dating advice. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about knowledge of syntax per se, but it can help you write some good poetry or something, I figure. Can't wait to hear how much of my native language I've been getting wrong without noticing. <laughs> there you go. Um... Native language, does that mean you're British and you're hearing it from an American, no less? Oh, goodness. Trying to write a novel, hope this helps me write good. Perfect. All right. Well, and hello, Olivia. Teehee, Finn. Okay. <laughs> and hello, okay, Cricket. And Landon Yellow. Landon, Ye Landon Yellow? I don't know. And Pasta Man, where can I find a good guide for ballpoint? I don't know. Um, I know Lux makes some content. Lux is a really high-level ballpoint player and has been for some time. You could also go and watch sets from top ballpoint players. Storm plays it. And how's it going, Ty? And jo Joe Winks. 
Why do you ride on a bus but in a car? There's probably some history to that that I don't know. Why is Shakespeare? Why not? This is a better answer, I think. English and social studies guy or math and science guy? I Okay, I think they're all really important. Um, I think that you, they both inform each other. And that neglecting any one of them is a big mistake. Um, I, I was going into school for English education, but I insisted on taking the physics that was actually for, I think it was engineering majors. Like, I didn't want to skimp on that because I was at the level where I could handle it, and so I did. I think it was valuable, too. Anyway. So, here's the deal. I've had this idea for some time that I, the stuff that I taught over the course of a full year in, like, my middle school classes... I think in terms of just the content, not in terms of the kids practicing it, you know, internalizing it, being forced to use it themselves, you know, that process, especially when they're having to learn other things at the same time, that takes a long time. And that's really where most of your time is spent as a teacher. Like, knowing the information is important, but it's like 15% of your job. Most of your job is getting the kids to actually engage with it, and that's the hard part. I've had this idea, this theory for a while, that I think I could probably teach everything that I taught in a year in a single, like, stream's worth of lesson time. Like, I bet I can actually get through my entire curriculum on English syntax in this stream right here. And I want to test that theory with you guys as my guinea pigs. Um, it's, uh, this is not like I just, you know, alluded to the ideal way to learn any of this because this is going to go fast. And as soon as there's one thing you don't get and have to ask a question about, it's probably going to derail a lot of what comes later because everything builds on itself in syntax here. Um, this is a really difficult topic to teach and you have to do it in the right order. And if you don't do it in exactly the perfect order, what ends up happening is you, get, you teach someone a rule that they internalize and then realize they'll need to break later. Um, and that's challenging, so. Um, like I said, this is not ideal for how you're going to learn things best, but it's more of a proof of concept kind of thing. And I think it actually could be potentially a valuable resource for someone who's just trying to get a crash course in how it works. Like I figure this might actually be pretty useful for maybe like an English language learner who can understand what I'm saying, but needs, you know, the fundamentals behind it. Um, kind of like someone who's been playing guitar by ear for 10 years, but is finally coming back to learn music theory kind of deal. I figure it could be helpful for that kind of a person. So, what the heck? Let's give it a shot. If nobody watches it, that's fine. I, I got to be a teacher for a day. So, um, first thing that we want to talk about, uh, I'm going to put down a little bit of an agenda here, actually. I think that's a smart way to do this. So, um, first thing is we need to have a little bit of talk before we actually get into the lesson. Uh, one of those things is going to be about descriptivism. One of those things is going to be about formal English. Um, and these are, actually, believe it or not, you know, you came here for a grammar lesson. Uh, these are going to be somewhat political um, because language is a part of culture. And culture is always politicized. Um, maybe we get to a day where, where that's not the case, but um, there is all sorts of um, all sorts of issues that arise as a result of cultures being different from each other, cultures clashing with each other. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the ways that these lessons should be taken. Um, there's a little bit of an ethics course that has to go along with any grammar instruction. Um, I know that sounds crazy, but, but hear me out here. So for a while in teaching English, the general approach that people used was called prescriptivism. Um, this is a, a label that is, um, as far as I know, um, and I'm completely blanking on the term, 
Um, but it is out of the time and place. Uh, anachronistic. Anachronistic is the word. Uh, this is a term that was not used to describe grammar instruction at the time, as far as I know. I believe that the dichotomy, the pairing and op opposition of prescriptivism and descriptivism, that, that that terminology was coined, you know, later on in the study of the language. But these two terms refer to the way that the language is handled, the way that uh, a teacher is an authority on that subject. Prescriptivism would have you believe that there are rules to English, that you are not speaking English if you do not follow the rules, that the way that you need to communicate with somebody is already, you know, penned down. It is a part of the language as it exists in dictionaries, in grammar manuals and whatnot, and that we need to bend to those authorities on the subject, that it should only be experts on language who declare, you know, new words to be coined and who um, dictate how syntax should work. Um, and again, like, I don't think that anybody would have consciously said that they believe that from previous teaching, but that's the way that it was kind of taught for a very long time that English teachers were kind of the authorities on the subject. They were the people who studied it, who knew it, and they were in the classrooms because they knew it and they could communicate it to other people. And the other people's job was to take it exactly the way that the English teachers gave it to them and to repeat it to say whatever it was that they needed. Descriptivism changes that by recognizing something that is undeniably true, which is that the language is constantly changing. Everything is, is totally changing in the English language all the time. Um, you look back at Shakespeare, like someone mentioned earlier in the chat, and Shakespeare wrote completely differently than we do now. There's no question about it. It's very difficult to understand if you've never read Shakespeare before or someone else who was his contemporary. Um, there's a lot of context that you're missing. And there are a lot of words that just work differently than they do now. Um, and we're, that pace is accelerating, too. With the internet and the ease of writing, more language is being coined all the time. That language has a better chance to spread to more people. And so over time, people are just learning and creating new words. So descriptivism says, wait a minute, how can we say that there are rules to the English language when the language itself is constantly altering itself. And it's that puts you in the position as a descriptivist of having to defend, okay, but if we can just say whatever we want, then how do people understand each other? And so the way that descriptivism answers that, which is where the name comes from, is it describes the language. It looks out into the world, sees, here is the way that the English language is being used currently, here are examples that I can see of it being used in this way, that I can timestamp, that I can show you. And so using this pattern that we are noticing in the way that the language is used, we can deduce these rules from it. We can figure out how the language will make sense to somebody else based on the way that other people in large, large, large quantities are using it. It's a very scientific analysis of language. Um, and through this kind of analysis, wow. descriptivist analysis, you still can come up with some rules that you can test people on. Because you're not telling them, you know, this is the rule that I dictate must be the way that you speak in English. It's more, well, if you say this in this community of people, they will have more trouble understanding you because this is the not the way that they say it. And I, you know, have been out there in the world to see that this is not the way that they say it. And I have analyzed the way that they say it. Here is the way they say it. And so here is the way that I am recommending you communicate your point instead. And that's the, the lens through which all of what I'm saying should be understood. I am a descriptivist, and I think that the, the overwhelming majority of the community of people who teach the language currently 
that I've interacted with and that I've seen writings about are descriptivists. You know, this is something that is probably not going away anytime soon. Um, and so that leads us to the next point that we have to talk about here, which is formal English. People love to take the language and use it to correct each other. People just adore being able to correct someone's grammar when they don't like them. Um, it's, you know, you'd love to take a, a really valid point that your opponent made on, in a tweet and crucify them on Twitter for using the wrong version of your in that tweet. Um, and I think that that aspect of the language is really toxic and not interesting at all. Um, when an English teacher corrects a student, it is with the interest of that student being understood. And that's the most important part here. Um, and people take that out of its context where the teacher, you know, needs to get the student up to speed and use it on each other as, you know, people who are peers. And it's just really pointless. Um, formal English is something that we don't even really need to use. Plenty of people just don't use it in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, plenty of people... Uh, kiting is, I would say, jargon, which is probably something that doesn't quite fit into that exact, uh, you know, paradigm there. Um, jargon being terms that are specific to a particular trade that are not going to be well known to the general public, but will be known to that particular community. Um, and whenever anybody is in like a scientific field or any, any other pursuit that needs new terminology in order for something to be understood, then they're going to coin words because they're just at the forefront of that industry. And that's something that I think even prescriptivists have been behind for some time. But anyway, going back to formal English. Formal English is this idea that we probably should have a very set idea of what the English language is, at least for certain situations where we really desperately need to be as understood as humanly possible. Um, this is the language that you're going to get from newscasters. This is the language that you're going to get if you go into like a UN negotiation and all of the people in that room are like quadrilingual, which means that English is like their third language. And they've only been able to learn it by the book. They haven't had time to learn all of the different dialects. They haven't been in a region that uses the slang that you might try to use. And in that context, you really need to be as coherent and understandable as possible to the, the vast majority of people. And so there is a pattern of English that has kind of coalesced to form what our idea of formal English is. It is English that you use in situations where anybody who has studied the language in whatever region, in whatever dialect, should be able to get enough of what you're saying that they can understand you. Um, and that's the purpose of language being formal. That's the big reason why teachers are, you know, English teachers tend to be such sticklers. It's because your language, the slang that you speak with your friends, may be really difficult for somebody from a different generation or a different place to understand. And there is a version of English that's not like that, and that's what it's useful to learn from school. Um, so you're not going to necessarily use everything that you learned in school in your day-to-day -day communication with people you already know. This sort of language is for when you have to appear in court, for when you have to talk to some authority figure in, say, the government, um, when you have a job that requires you to be able to communicate with people from different cultures, different regions, whatever, this is the kind of English that you fall back on. And so that's why we have... Um, such, you know, strict rules. That's why you get corrected so often in English classes. Um, that's so that we have this way that we can all understand each other that is based on the way that we've seen the language being used the most and what people will understand the best. That's the context I want everyone to be taking this in um, because if you take, if you try to insist on someone speaking formal English Outside of those kinds of contexts, if you just hear someone 
casually talking in a dialect on the street and you correct them, quote unquote, that's starting to become something pretty problematic, actually. Like, that's starting to become xenophobic. That's starting to become, well, what's wrong with the way that they're saying it? You understood them, didn't you? So what makes your way of speaking, your dialect, better than their dialect? And that's the sort of thing that really gets pretty heavily politicized. Um, that's something that can become a problem really quickly. I'll give you an actual real-world example I've experienced of this. Um, and we will define syntax, but we haven't gotten to syntax yet. This is the disclaimers before we get to syntax. I, I promise we will pick up once we get to the actual learning of syntax, but these are actually pretty important, I think. Um, here's a real example. In uh, Spain, there is a region called Catalonia, which includes, includes the city of Barcelona, which you've probably heard of. Barcelona is one of the top three tourist destinations in the world, um, by, in terms of cities anyway. I don't know about like locales or anything like that. But like there's, there's like Paris and then London, I think, and then Barcelona. I think it's in that order, last I checked. And so um, Barcelona, really big, important tourist city, you know, a big commercial area for Spain. But Catalonia, historically, is somewhat culturally distinct from other people in Spain. And... What's happened is, you know, while all of these people of Spain, there has been talk about Catalonia seceding because they claim to have a separate culture, different, you know, ideas for the direction that they want their place to take, and they want self-governance. Um, I know this because I was in Barcelona during a particularly heated moment with lots of protests um, and kind of a citywide moment of, uh, you know, flying flags out the window and um, being pretty outspoken about their feelings on that, that secession. One of the ways, politically speaking, that the, the main country of Spain responded to this was, since their argument was Catalonia is too small, too not well known of a place to be able to function on its own, that it therefore needs to stay as a part of Spain. And one piece of evidence that they would give for that is they would say that the language of Catalonia, which is called Catalan, is basically just a dialect of Spanish. That its language is basically just Spanish with some, you know, extra touches. That that was kind of the argument that they would go for. The, the language, because it was a part of Catalonian culture became a politicized thing. And so because of that issue um, of the secession, the Catalan language, whether it was a dialect or whether it was, you know, a formal break off of Spanish, you know, that's something where someone might look at that and go, oh, it's just a dialect, therefore it's part of our language and subject, subject to our authority. It's something that we have control over. You see a similar sort of deal in the United States with movements where, you know, people will rudely talk to someone who's just minding their own business and say, you should speak English. We speak English here um, when they weren't even, you know, being talked to. You know, maybe they're worried about being talked about behind their back or something. I don't know. Um, that sort of thing is a means of control. Like, it's, it's pretty easy to go from that kind of thinking to reinforcing some somewhat racist or classist ideas. Um, so I want to be, you know, really clear about the context in which we're talking about these rules, how they should be used, and, you know, what, what their purpose is. So, anyway, um, and, and we've, it looks like we've, we've got some, uh, Looks like we've got some supporters of, of Catalonia in the chat as well. Yeah, um, that was it was a very, very interesting conversation that I had got to have with a linguist uh, that that guy. I swear you could have thought that that was a kid from Michigan from how well he spoke English, how fluently he spoke it. But it wasn't even his second language. It was like his third language or something. Linguists are the coolest people. Anyway, um, with that all being said. Let's talk about what syntax is, and then we will talk about how we're going to break it down and, you know, what aspects of this we're going to talk about and how we'll get to how they build on each other as we go. So 
what is syntax? Because that is a word that, unless you're a computer programmer, you probably didn't learn while you were in school. Um, it's a pretty, despite the fact that that's basically all you're learning when you learn English grammar, that's not a word that people use an awful lot of the time. Um, syntax is the study of word order and how words function in a sentence. Um, when you write out a sentence, how is it that we know to get meaning out of it? Because I can just put down a bunch of words. Um, let's see. Um, I can just put down a bunch of words right here. And those words don't mean anything, even though they're all English words. Why is that? Well, that's because they don't follow any kind of syntactical principles here. We know how to read a sentence because we at least intuitively understand the syntax of that language. We know that it doesn't make any sense, like, who's doing the running? There needs to be a subject for run, at least implicitly, unless this is a command. But then, okay, so run river, what does it mean to run a river? That, that might be a lexical problem, that be, might be a problem with the definitions of the words. But then, what's purple? Is the river purple? If the river was purple, then purple should be before river. Like, these are things that we as English speakers are automatically doing when we read stuff, but we don't really always think about it in that way because it's just so intuitive, especially if it's our native language. So syntax is how do you get the words in an order that they mean something that someone else will be able to parse, that is, read effectively, when they see it themselves. So... We're going to split this up into a few different pieces here. Uh, we're going to start by talking about words and then move more and more and more towards constructions of words. Then, you know, we'll get to larger ones and more complex interactions between them. So we're starting with parts of speech. And then we'll move on to roles in a sentence. From there, we'll talk about clauses. And then we'll hit verbals at the end because those are just... Verbals are evil, man. Um... And they, they deserve to be talked about after we understand all of this other stuff because they're kind of in a weird in-between category. So that's it. That's, that's everything we're going to be talking about today. But that should be everything that you need in order to be able to understand English language without knowing vocabulary. Um, that's the only part of this that that won't test. Um, and vocabulary is just a memorization exercise. There's no way around it. You're going to have to learn tens of thousands of words if you want to be fluent in English. Sorry. Uh, that's just... Human communication is complicated. So, <clears throat> let's start with parts of speech. So, first of all, every word has a, at least a part of speech it can play. And in a sentence, a word is exactly one part of speech. So for example, you could have a word that can be a noun or an adjective. You could have a word that can be an adverb or a preposition. But in that sentence, it's only ever going to do one of those things. So um, it's, it's in a quantum state of superposition until it's put into a sentence. And then that senten sentence's context tells you how it needs to be read. Um, so the first one we'll start with is the easiest one by far. This is the one that, you know, I won't say that like babies know the word noun per se, but this is like the first kind of word that you ever learn when you are a child. Because all you need to know to understand, understand a noun is pointing to a thing that you want and saying a certain combination of words uh, or sorry, a certain combination of syllables and having that thing brought to you so that now you know that when you say that word, it means that thing. Um, nouns are a person, place, thing, or idea. We can just sum it up like that, and that's pretty much all that we need to know in terms of the base definition of a noun. So a person's name is a noun. Microphone is a noun. Computer is a noun. But you also have places, so... The United States is a noun. Um, thing is just any general object, the floor, a chair, and idea. So the word idea is a noun. 
Now, is an idea something you can see, touch, not really. It does have a physical reality in the sense that it's a combination of neural circuitry in our heads, I guess. Uh, one that can be communicated through sound waves to other people. It's kind of complicated to think about it as a thing. So we include the word idea in there to cover concepts. You know, existentialism is a noun. So not necessarily anything that you can perceive, but definitely like anything that you can talk about, anything that can be acted on. Um, can't wait until we get to pronouns. Yep, there's there's politics there too. There's politics there too, unfortunately. Shouldn't be, but there is. Um, <laughs> God. We'll, we'll talk about it when we get to pronouns. We'll, we'll, that'll, that'll be like number six or something of the eight parts of speech. There are eight of these, by the way. So, we're already done with one of them. Nouns. Person, place, thing, or idea. What I literally have my students do when I teach noun is just say, okay... What I want you to do right now, just like take a second to yourself and say out loud, noun, a person, place, thing, or idea. Noun, person, place, thing, or idea. 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 Just say it 20 times to yourself. And now you're not going to forget it. Um, it's really that easy. We can just narrow it down to five words. And that's what a noun is. So um, that's, that's a way that I tend to have people work with that. Verbs are a little bit more complicated. Um, now, verbs are still one of those very early things that you learn as a kid, and they're the single most important part of the English language in general. Like, if you're going to understand a sentence, you need to be able to spot the verb, and the verb is the most important part. If you put nothing else in a sentence, chances are it's probably the verb. Um, maybe it's a noun, usually it's a verb. So, a verb, there are two kinds of verbs, and we'll talk about their definitions separately here. So, one kind of verb is an action verb. And then another kind is a state of being verb. There was uh, uh, some kind of, I don't even remember what it was. Was it like a government fitness campaign or something like that? That was on TV on like Nickelodeon for a long time, where it'd say verb. It's what you do. And that stuck with me because it was on TV when I was a child. Um, and that's always helped me remember verbs. But if I throw a ball, the word throw is the thing that I'm doing. And that's an action verb. Whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you are acting to do, that is a verb. But there are also another kind, there's also another kind of verb because if I say, I am a teacher... The verb in that sentence is am. Now, am I doing anything to just be? To just exist as a teacher? Not really. That's not really an action I'm taking. It's a state of being. It's the way that I am. And so that is also a verb. You'll get those two kinds, and we'll break those down significantly more as time goes on. There are a lot more that'll... Uh, isn't it what you do also a Geico slogan? I don't think so, but I, I could be wrong. Um, so we'll break these down like way, way more than we already have. But this is what we have the context to understand for now. We're going to flesh this out later. But for the time being, this is all we need to know. Um, so nouns and verbs, pretty standard. The, these are the basic building blocks of sentences. Like once you have especially verbs, but definitely, you know, afterwards nouns, you can start constructing some very, very basic sentences. Toby ran. See Scott run. Um, that one's actually a little bit more complicated, and we need to get into multiple clauses to actually understand that sentence, which is kind of funny. But um, those kinds of things, you know, we can start talking about. But let's get one layer deeper first. Um, shoot, I can't scroll any further because we don't have another page yet. One sec. Let's create another page by doing that and then come back. Okay. So now we should be in a good spot. All right. Now, modifiers are not a unique part of speech. They are a category of a part of speech. Um, so there are two parts of speech here that we're going to talk about, and unfortunately... Okay, we'll just have to do it this way. 
I actually, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this and then this. So that, that way these ones can be on the same level as the noun and the verb. But modifiers is like the category that's over the top of both of them. So let's, you know, let's just bump these, this all down to the next page. So we scroll. Okay. So modifiers. Uh, these are words that take another word in the sentence and modify them, change them. Um, what I want you all to do right now, everybody who's in this in this stream chat, who's in this classroom, I want you to close your eyes, do it, or no one will ever smooch you, and you'll step on every Lego you ever see. Have to add that last one because the Arrow Ace people would, would probably just keep their eyes open and look at me smugly and defiantly if I didn't. Um, close your eyes, and I want you to imagine in your head a cow. Okay, put that cow in your head. Where is the cow? Standing in a field or something? Is it mooing at you? Is it just kind of chewing on some grass? Is it being pecked at by an emu named Stompy. Just get that cow in your head very firmly. And now think about the way that your image in your head changes when I say now think about a blue cow. We went from cow to blue cow. The image that you had in your head probably wasn't blue until I said to think about a blue cow. But now that I included the word blue, this image cow in your head has changed. It has been modified. That's what a modifier does. You can open your eyes now. Cow is licking me. Cow is dancing Polishly. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's what a modifier does. Now, there are two kinds of modifiers, and they're both going to take another word in the sentence. So in the last one, blue was modifying cow. They're all going to take another word in the sentence and change it in some way or give you some more information about it is another way of thinking about it. But they're going to do it to different words and for different reasons. So adjectives modify. So remember, we talked about what modifying is. Nouns and pronouns. So that's the first way to tell that you're looking at an adjective. When you look at blue, you go like, okay, blue is changing the idea I have in my head about cow. So blue is modifying cow. Since cow is a noun, it's a thing or a, a person, if you'd like. Um, I don't know what universe we're living in. Then we can classify blue in that context at least as an adjective because it's modifying a noun it's changing our idea of what that noun does and it does this for pronouns as well we'll talk about what pronouns are in a second uh and uh, other things pertaining to pronouns Yeesh. um and then adverbs actually no wait there's there's one other step in this process that i want actually eh, let's talk about adverbs first let's talk about adverbs first adverbs modify one of a few different things verbs adjectives or other adverbs there are three different things that they can modify nouns and pronouns we will find out there's a reason that noun is in the name of pronoun they act pretty much exactly the same way and pronouns just have a little extra trick to them um <laughs> we're being raided by grisgo vp who uh may or may not have realized that they're bringing everyone to english class uh welcome everybody um, so here's an example of an adverb because we haven't talked about one. Let's close our eyes again. And again, I'm going to insist on this because again, otherwise no one will ever smooch you and, or you will step on every Lego you ever see. So we close our eyes, picture Sonic the Hedgehog, why not? And Sonic the Hedgehog is walking. Okay, walking is going to be our word that we're going to modify here. So just think of a nice little walk cycle. You know, you're just tilting the control stick just a little bit so that they start to, you know, get going, but they're not actually running and their feet aren't twirling around in that figure eight shape yet. 
Now, think about Sonic walking drunkenly. Just kind of kind of stumbling around. Now think about Sonic walking briskly. Going around, you know, like a, a middle-aged mom going for a walk in, in 45 degree weather, you know, get, gets the blood going. And now think of Sonic walking slowly. Just kidding, that's, it, it's, it's Sonic, he doesn't do that. All of these words that we're using to change the verb walking, we can open our eyes now. All of these words that we're changing to you, using to change the verb walking are adverbs. So if you've got that L-Y ending at the end of it, not all the time, but a lot of the time that's going to be an adverb. Slowly, quickly, drunkenly. All of those that I chose happened to be L-Y adverbs. It's not always the way that it goes, but um, that's usually like a good guess. Like if you're given a word by a game show host and you have to tell them what part of speech it is, and if you don't, you don't win a million dollars. Adverb's a pretty good one to go for if it's an L-Y ending. But they can also modify adjectives. So, for example, that cow we talked about earlier, that cow wasn't just blue. That cow was really, really blue. Really is an adverb that's changing our idea of how blue it was. If I, said, if I went from really blue to kind of blue, kind of, okay, kind of, it functions like an adverb there. Um, let's say barely blue versus really blue. Those both change our understanding of that adjective. And you can also have other adverbs. So, for example, she sings hilariously badly. Badly is describing the singing, is modifying the singing, but hilariously is modifying badly. How badly? Very badly. And that brings us to our next point here, um, because this is, strictly speaking, about the only way that you need to figure out whether you're looking at an adjective or an adverb, and this is a thing we're going to have to do a lot here, but... There's another set of questions that I've found very useful in helping to teach the concept so that we now have two methods of telling adjectives apart from adverbs. Because um, knowing adverbs from adjectives and adverbs from all sorts of other things is one of the most common mistakes people make. And these concepts are going to be all day. We're going to be talking about these this entire stream. Everything that we talk about is going to build on this concept right here. So it's really, really crucial that we get the baseline here so that we understand these two apart. The way we're going to do that is with a pair of questions. So the adjective questions and the adverb questions. Adjective questions. Which one? What kind? How many? So now that we've got them written down, here's how you use these. A blue cow what you're looking for is if you think that blue might be modifying cow, but you're not sure, one way to confirm that for yourself is to figure out what question, what adjective question, does blue answer about the cow? So there are a couple of these that could work here. Like we could say, which cow was it? Oh, it's the blue cow. Or what kind of cow was it? It was a blue cow. Oh, wow, that's a very special cow right there. Yes, it is a special cow. Um, any of these could work, but because blue answers this question, which one or what kind, about the cow, and since that question is an adjective question, that's a pretty good rationale for deciding, you know, I think this is an adjective that's modifying cow. When we say how many, numbers are included here. So if you say I have seven apples, how many apples? Seven apples. Seven is an adjective there. Adverbs. We have a number of different questions here, and these ones are a little bit looser and a little bit more open to interpretation. Sometimes these can be misused. Um, this is a, a mnemonic device that I give kids that 
sometimes leads them astray. Um, takes a little bit of experience to get used to how to use these, but... How, when, where, to what extent, and why are the questions that I teach as adverb questions. So, for example, how did Sonic walk? He walked drunkenly. When did Sonic walk? He walked yesterday. Where did Sonic walk? He walked upward. To what extent did he walk? He walked barely. He had a rough day yesterday. Lots of lots of running. He's kind of sore. Um, why? Let's see. The, the, there are very few situations where why even comes into play. Um, and I always one of the problems with me improvising this is that all of my examples I'm coming up with on the spot, and so sometimes there are going to be a few of these where I don't have something prepared right off the top of my head. Um, I'll have to come back to that one. I might just take it off the list because, again, it's very rare that one of these four isn't actually the, the one that we're going to work with. That's uh, that's that's going to be a little extra. If we if we run into an example of that while I'm talking my way through it, then maybe we'll go back to those. But this part right here is an entire unit. You know, this is something that I spend like two weeks or something at least, making sure everyone under understands and drilling them w on those things. Because if people are getting this wrong later on in the year, th that just becomes more and more of a problem because more and more gets built on that. Mr. Gem, I need to go use the restroom. Can I go? I can't stop you. I'm not physically in the room with you. I can't write you a referral. I don't even know your name, dude. Go, go to the bathroom. Um, in fact, I'm going to go and get a drink of water just to show that we all have agency here. We're all adults, and I'm thirsty. I say we're all adults. We're not actually probably all adults, but you know what? I'm going to treat you all like it. Incorrect word adjective when it objectively should be ad noun. You know, that makes sense. But that's not the way that the language has been. And we've been using this word for so long that at this point, that's how it is. That's descriptivism for you. We're not following the rules. We're just looking at what other people do. People forgetting it's may I, not can I. Eh. In the eyes of a child, the two are easily conflated. Anyway. So, now that we've got that covered, and you'll never mess any of those up ever, even though I haven't gone into any examples at all besides the ones that we started with, uh, we're, gonna, we're just going to move on from there and, and pretend that everybody here understands all of those perfectly well and could spot them in a sentence. Because, uh, like I said at the beginning of this, this is going to be me teaching you the concepts. This is not going to be me helping you learn the concepts. <laughs> this is going to be a lecture that maybe you can use as a resource. But if you need practice on this, the nice thing about you know practice on this is that it's very easy to find practice on this. Like you can just type in you know identifying adverbs problems, and you'll find some some teacher who uploaded their worksheets or something. So. Should be pretty easy to get practice if you're looking for it. But we're going to move on because we're getting all of this done in one stream. So that right there is half of the parts of speech. We've got nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. And something that I like to do is 
draw stuff up like this. And the arrow is going to show what modifies what. So an adjective modifies a noun. And so we draw this arrow. Adjectives modify nouns. Adverbs modify adjectives, verbs, and other adverbs. Nouns and verbs, remember, are not modifiers. So we don't have arrows drawn from these to anywhere else. So hopefully that is helpful. Uh, unfortunately, I do have to get rid of all of these arrows, so I hope you've already got those in your notes. Okay. Uh, let's get pronouns out of the way right now, just because we're... Actually, no, wait. It's probably better to jump into prepositions from here and hit pronouns later, because pronouns are relatively easy to understand after, you know, especially after you've learned the language as well as you have, so... Prepositions, though, build directly off of this adjectives, adverbs business. So prepositions are a little bit more abstract and a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is something that a lot of people get wrong, even as native English speakers, um, because it really involves something rather complicated. So I'm going to type this definition. It's going to make zero sense to you, and then I'm going to explain it. Okay. Prepositions, take nouns, turn them into modifiers. So what's a preposition? Well, it's kind of hard to spot unless you just kind of already know what you're looking for. But there aren't that many prepositions in the English language. That You know, you could probably come up with a list of like 50. I don't know if I could come up with a list of 100 just off the top of my head, though. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to take a noun and any of the nouns, you know, adjectives that are attached to it. So remember, we talked about a blue cow earlier, right? Well, in a blue cow, blue is a modifier on cow. A is also a modifier on cow. Which cow? A tells us we're just looking at any old cow, because a cow and the cow would be very different things to say. The cow means there's one particular cow that we're looking for there. Which cow? A the cow. Which cow? A cow means we don't care quite so much. <clears throat> so that's the way that this all goes. Now, the noun, you know, can come along with all of its modifiers and everything with, with its, its, its group there. It's, it's uh, posse. It's, it's, it's friend group. I don't know. It's, it's, anyway. Um, but... Then, we have this. So, we drove past a blue cow. Let's look at this sentence. Drove, and this is the way that we're always going to break down sentences, and we'll go over this maybe a little bit later once we've got all of the parts of speech. Drove is our verb, and it's the only verb in the sentence. We is a pronoun, so maybe we shouldn't go into that one yet, but this is just going to act like a noun. So we'll, we'll call it a noun for now. And then we have this cow that's also a noun. Past, though, is taking this word cow, or this phrase, a blue cow, and using it kind of as reference for where we drove. You could say we drove backwards, we could say we drove home, or you could say we drove past a blue cow. If you were to somehow take past a blue cow and make it into a word, that word would be an adverb describing where we drove. Past is a preposition. Good golly, I fit it all in there with this this mouse that somehow changed sizes. Cool. Um, and it's taking this, what we'll call a noun phrase, which is just a noun and all of the modifiers that go along with it. And it's turning all of that into an adverb modifying drove. How did this cow come to be blue? Good question. 
Um, maybe somebody painted it. I don't know. That's probably not good for the cow. But it's uh, definitely not a natural occurrence. <clears throat> but that's why it's noteworthy. Maybe it's also a cow that's made of fiberglass. They've got a lot of those out in, like, diners. Um, you just go on a road trip somewhere. Anyway. So that's what a preposition does. It takes a noun and makes it do adjective or adverb... Ooh, hello. Makes it do adjective or adverb things. It lets what would normally just be a person, place, thing, or idea become a modifier. And for a great example of, you know, how we can string these together, because we can just kind of keep going, I will now write out the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States. You know, something that school children recite in classes, which is kind of creepy when you think about it and a little bit dystopian, but here we are. Um, so, so far no prepositions, but here we have to the flag of the United States of America. So, already we've got to the flag is one. Two is a preposition. And then flag is the noun that's getting turned into a modifier. So what kind of allegiance? It's allegiance to the flag. So it's doing this. Now, which flag are we talking about? Where we're talking about the flag of the United States. And which states are they? They're the United States of America. We'll just put a P for now. P will eventually mean pronoun, which is why I don't use that. Actually, I think I tend to go P-R-O-N or P-R-E-P -E um, just to keep things unconfusing. But we haven't talked about pronouns yet, so you guys don't know they exist. <laughs> eh, that's funny. Um, so which flag? The flag of the United States of America. Which states? The states of America. So we've already got three prep phrases in there, but it keeps going. And, so that's a conjunction, we'll talk about that later, to the Republic, so there's one, for which it stands. This one includes a clause, which we won't worry about, but for which it stands, for which, this is going to be a prep phrase. One nation, so we're out of the prepositional phrase, but only for so long. Under is a preposition, God, comma, Indivisible is just an adjective. With, there's a preposition, liberty and justice for all. So, total prep phrases there. We've got one. And this one, what we would really probably do is nest it. So, we'd have of the United States and then of America. I think I got that right. I probably didn't get that right. No, I didn't get that right. Um, oh, right. Okay, this one shouldn't be here. That's my problem. Let me put a second one here. So we'd probably nest it like that. Uh, and then we've got one here. Got one here. One here. One here. And one here. Lots of prep phrases in there. If you're ever looking for some practice and you, you need something and you're an American and you've been taught all of that, that's a good way to, to go and figure out if you can find prepositional phrases. Anyway, so... So it turns nouns into modifiers by starting a prepositional phrase. Prepositional phrases are preposition followed by the noun phrase. Why has it got to work that way? Followed by the noun phrase that's being turned into a modifier. Okay. 
that's something that a lot of people get wrong. That's something a lot of people don't internalize and understand. And it's really difficult to teach because at a certain point, you kind of just got to get yourself familiar with which words are prepositions. And uh, th there was a teacher the year before mine one year who taught the kids a song to help them remember a whole bunch of prepositions, which I thought was a great idea and helped a lot up until the point where we ran into any preposition that wasn't in the song, and then the kids never identified it. It was really, really rough whenever I used a word that just wasn't in that song. And another thing that happened is that kids wouldn't recognize that some of the words that were in that song could also be, for example, an adverb. Over, for example. Uh, if you say... Um... She jumped over. Here, over is an adverb. Where did she jump? She jumped over. Whereas, now we have a noun here that's being lassoed by over and turned into this adverbial idea. So depending on how a word gets used, it can be one of these different parts of speech, but we've got to kind of look at the sentence and think, okay, if this is a preposition, what's its noun? Where is that? And we'll call it an object of a preposition later on. Where is the OP, the, the overpowered object of a preposition? Where is that at? Um, if we can't find that, then they we're probably wrong that it's a preposition. Okay. Let's be done with prepositions for now. They'll probably come back at some point. The, that's most of what there is to say about them, but they definitely add a level of complexity when you're breaking a sentence down, guys. Uh, it's it's, it's going to get complex. It's going to get complex. <laughs> she jumped over. Isn't just... A, Okay, that, that was probably not, yeah, because you, you probably could say, you could make the argument that what's really happening here is that we're moving this from here. So, okay. Uh, what's another good example here? Oh, okay. She jumped down. Down is just a direction. You know, that's just a, a way that you can go. We're not necessarily saying that she jumped down the, 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 the down the, the line or something. I don't know. But if we say she jumped down the street, now that means something different. This is a better example. Thank you for pointing that out. She jumped over. Yeah, no, not not quite, not quite. All right. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about pronouns. A lot of my audience is from the Splatoon community, and you know, therefore, we're we're pretty familiar with the concept of pronouns. I would say uh, this is a very gay community, <laughs> but. Let's talk about it from a grammatical perspective, and then we'll talk about the place that pronouns end up becoming politicized by, by very frustrating people. So, pronouns are basically a variable in math. Like, think about the letter x being used in a math equation. So, 2x equals 8. We now know that x equals 4. But if we have another problem later on where we say 3x equals 9, now we know that x equals 3. x is the same letter, but it's used in a bunch of different scenarios. I should probably put some space in between those so it's not confusing. But used in a bunch of different scenarios to mean different things. And the way that we figure out what this means is through context. Same exact deal happens with pronouns. Pronouns replace nouns to avoid needless repetition. 
Because it would be really obnoxious if I had to write out in a sentence um, the <laughs> World Health Organization um, to collect funding to keep the World Health Organization able to continue doing what the World Health Organization does. This is a, it's a lot easier to say as the World Health Organization. We have to say it once so we know what we're talking about. To collect funding to keep doing oh so to, to keep it doing what to, oh I, I worded this weirdly to keep it able to continue doing what it does see how much easier this is to read see how much less cluttered it is see how much less space it takes on the page it's just way too convenient to be able to plug that in it's also really useful to have a pronoun for a case of ambiguity, that is, of not knowing what we're talking about exactly. For example, If I had to say the male person came and the male person seemed like the male person had trouble finding the mailbox. Um, actually, no, this is not a great example. I, I messed up my example here. Um, we'll come back to that one actually when we talk about the pronoun gender. Um, that's that's a different example. Th this is, again, the part where this is all going to fall apart by being improvised. The fact that I don't have my examples ready to go off the top of my head. And these are not always going to be great. Um, A person came to the door and they left a package. So we know it's a person, but we don't know too much about them. We don't have a name to give them. So sometimes it might just be useful to refer to them as a pronoun. So that it's like whoever it was, they did. Uh... In an English book, I once saw the sentence needing correction. David chose David for a task. I thought there were two people named David, which made it hard to understand. The correct answer was David chose himself. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's that's a good example for you know how pronouns can be useful as well. Um, so we know kind of what pronouns do. There's a chart. Um, can I create charts? I bet I can create it. Here we go. So we're going to create a chart, and we're going to need, let's see, We want to have it be four columns and then just as many down as it'll let us have. There, that's good. Okay. So, here's the way that I tend to prefer to break this down because pronouns have four important different characteristics. Pronouns have person, number, gender, and case. So we'll talk about person first. Person is first, second, or third person. So Splatoon is a third person shooter. Call of Duty is a first person shooter. Now that's the difference there. Um, so to, to clarify further, first person, the speaker referring to themselves. Yes, I stand by themselves being a, dr a grammatical construct in this context. That is probably not something a pr prescriptivist would teach you, but we'll talk about that later. Um, pers second person is the speaker, ref uh, not that, the speaker referring, speaker. Good. It put an R in there because it decided that that was, God, we're not talking about making a sandwich. Anyway, speaker referring to the listener. So you, the person being spoken to, are going to be referred to in second person. You, like I just referred to you, 
is a second person pronoun. So, finally, third person is the speaker referring to a third party. Someone who is neither speaking nor being spoken to is who, who you would be describing using a third person pronoun. So that's person. Number is pretty simple. It's singular or plural. We don't really have any other numbers than that. You're either talking to one person, you're talking to some combination of different people. If you're talking to two people, that's they. If you're talking to a million people, that's they. If you're talking to one person, then that's he, she, they. It can be they, so I guess that's not a great example either. Um, da -da 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 -da. We'll get to that. Um, but uh, let's let's go off of the third person pronouns and talk about the first person pronouns. Uh, there's I, which is just me, one person, or there's we, which is me and any number of other different people. So there, there's a better example for pronoun number. Pronoun gender. Who boy. So languages have this, this tradition of gendering things that don't always need to be gendered. Um of including gender as a part of the language where you can t talk to someone and if you know one person is a man one person is a woman let's say then you would use some pronouns to refer to the man and other pronouns to refer to the woman and that adds some information about their identity that being said it has become more and more frequent that <coughs> excuse me that people challenge the gendering of language because the genders that are um, established in language are insufficient to describing the full range of gender experiences. Um, because as scientists are starting to find and verify through, you know, multiple different means, gender is not by, like, two different poles, two different set things it's really like two different sides of a spectrum and there's a whole lot of crap in between that isn't really well described by either of the sets of pronouns that have been laid out so this creates a little bit of a dilemma for the language and this is where pronouns become politicized it's this particular category right here um so gender, you know, literally just refers to the gender of the thing being referred to. So in English, we have pretty well set gender identifiers in the masculine, feminine, and neuter. And those are the three that, you know, traditional English, Engl the English that you would read from a long time ago, does pretty well at describing. If you get anywhere else outside of that binary, though, um, where neuter is like, you're talking about a rock, okay? Rocks do not reproduce, okay? It's, they do not have societal constructs built up around them either that tell you anything about what they should be. They are just rocks. So we refer to them as it. We do not refer to them as he or she. And not every language even does that. Um, some languages give uh, articles, that is, uh, the words a, the, and an uh, in English. So a thing, the thing, or an object, I guess, um, in, the, in the case that you need to switch it around. Some languages gender everything. I just cut out for a second. I'm, I'm dropping frames. So I'm going to wait until those come back. Okay, it looks like it came back online. We were dropping some frames for a sec. But I'm back now. Um, some languages gender everything. Like, it, one of the, the craziest things to me was um, I learned German for a few years. I'm not great with it. But in German, the word for skirt, like the, the article of clothing that a, a woman might traditionally wear, is a masculine article. It, it's it skirt is male 
for some reason. I don't know who decided that that was a thing, because that is not a stereotypically male thing. But, like, it's really pretty arbitrary. Bikini is also masculine. Awesome, right? Like, why? <laughs> who decided that, that that made sense? Someone someone was... was... Anyway, you know... I like that English actually avoids gendering language as much as it does. It does that a lot less than a lot of other languages do. But pronouns are one of those places, and that's where it starts to break down a little bit. So, we'll talk about exactly where on the pronoun chart this becomes an issue, and how different people have tried to address that issue in just, we don't have a word that we need to describe a thing. Um, or I, I guess it would always be a person in this instance. Um, and when we get there, we'll talk about it. But first, we need to talk about case. And when I say talk about case, I mean... That I had the caps lock on the whole time. Very cool. There. Uh, case, we do not have some important understanding to be able to follow what case is for now. So we'll worry about this after we've gone and talked about finish the parts of speech and we've gotten back into roles in the sentence, which is the next thing. So. Uh, you'll just have to trust me when I write these words up here and don't explain what they mean, that you will understand what these things mean eventually. But not now. So. We'll start with first person, second person, third person. Oh, shoot. Wait, I did this wrong. I need to add a bunch of columns here. And that's going to make this kind of big, unfortunately. But most of the words that are fitting into it are small. Okay. And then from here, so that's a person or person number, and we'll just get gender out of the way by putting them all in the same th same place. Okay. So nominative first person singular is going to be I. Nominative second person plural. Me. Us. My, my, and yeah, we'll just put them together. My, mine, our, ours. Okay, we need to, we're going to need to make the font size just a little bit smaller in here. Because having these not fit is kind of silly. There, okay. Hopefully those are still big enough to read. Okay, and then obsessive is going to be And there. Okay. Let's get rid of all of these extra. I don't know why I made this many of them. Uh, delete 13 rows. Perfect. Okay. So here's a good basic pronoun chart. Uh, there are other cases that we'll talk about. For example, uh, himself, themself, etc. came up earlier. Th those are reflexive or intensive pronouns. Um, and that would be a, a different case that we haven't talked about here, but we're just going to worry about these three for now. Um, might, might get into those other ones later. But I, I'm not going to be able to fit much else in this chart. So, <clears throat> first person, you know, referring to myself. And then gender 
is going to be the same because we don't need to, you know, it's never going to be useful to refer to myself with a gendered pronoun because you can just identify who the person is by what the, by the speaker, you know, by being the speaker. It's, it's not extra information. It's not useful. So we don't bother with it with the first or second person pronouns. If you're speaking or being spoken to, people know who you are. You're in the conversation already. So if you can be referred to in any useful way, there's no point in, you know, addressing something like gender. Now, if you have someone who is, you know, maybe recognizably masculine versus recognizably feminine, and you, you know, use different gendered pronouns to refer to those two different people, that might be beneficial in identifying them. Not necessarily, but that's the idea, at least, under this system of pro pronouns, and that's why maybe why we split them up. But... It's specifically the third person singular pronouns that are a, a subject of considerable political discussion. Um, because there are a number of different solutions that are being promoted in order to make it so that we have more available gender identities or maybe gender neutral expression available in the third person singular in English. If we only have he or she and somebody doesn't feel like those represent them, then that's not useful language. We're not going to try and call someone it because that's dehumanizing. That's, you know, comparing them to a rock, to a thing. So that's typically not what people will like. There are some people who do prefer it as a pronoun, just as an alternative, but a lot of people don't like it for that particular reason, and so that's not the most popular option that I have seen. There are a few different options that people will tend to go to in fixing the issue of the third-person singular pronoun and its gender. One of those is to construct new words, new pronouns. Uh, these are called neo-pronouns. Neo literally means new, so they're just new pronouns. People made because third person singular pronouns are all gendered, and that's silly. So, for example, um, I, th I believe it's Z Zier is a very common, and uh, I always get the Zs and the Xs mixed up, so I might have these backwards a little bit, but um, this is a pretty common neo-pronoun. Um, this is something that someone might use to refer to a person who he or she does not describe super well. Now, these are pretty common. These are one of the primary ways that you're going to see people address the issue of the third person singular. The problem that I personally, as a linguist, you know, me speaking as someone who's trying to analyze the language, would see with these is that there are so many of them. There are a lot of different alternative ideas that have been proposed as neo-pronouns, and they're all competing with each other for the same slot on the pronoun chart. Um, so I've seen a version, um, so there's Z's here, there's also a version with X's, I think it's ZZem, I believe. So like this. I think it's something like that. Um, and there's also, I've seen Fay Fair. I've seen, what else? That you can find like a list of like five or 10 really, really common ones. And I think as a descriptivist that over time, people are probably going to gravitate more toward an alternative, which is just using they, them. You look up at the pronoun chart a little bit and you see you. We use you as the second person nominative, both singular and plural. We also use it as the objective, both singular and plural. Why can't we just use they as both the singular and plural? It's almost never going to be confusing. Yes, occasionally 
it might make it unclear whether you're referring to a singular person or a group of people. There are some cases where that might actually cause a little bit of confusion, but they're very rare. Usually people know what you're talking about from the context. And so a lot of the time people just kind of go to this because it's a word that people already know. It's people already use, it's something people already use colloquially. And this is where the example I was trying to talk about earlier comes in. Let's say, you know, um, the male person came and left a package while I was gone. They must have not found the mailbox because it was just on the ground. Mail person here, we never saw them. We never talked to them, let alone asked for their pronouns. We have no idea who they are, what they look like, how they see themselves, or the rest of the world. This is just some other person. And colloquially, what you will often see people do anyway is just refer to this person as they. Because the thing about they is that because it's plural, it's also gender neutral. We don't need to know the gender of something because if you've got a group of people, one of them could be masculine, the other one could be feminine. And having one pronoun to describe that group is kind of pointless because it's a combination of different people with different genders. Even if it is a, just a group of women, like maybe we don't know that. So we already use they to be gender ambiguous anyway in colloquial speak. And it's worked out pretty well for us doing that. Since it's something that's already a part of the language, I feel like this is probably the way that I feel, if I had to, you know, predict the future, which humans are terrible at doing, this is probably the one that I feel like is most likely to catch on and go further. But there are definite advantages to the neo-pronouns. I just think that, like, if we're going to have neo-pronouns, we got to pick one at some point in time, and that that's got to be the one that's in the language. Um, if we're going to have something be non-binary. If the, you know, if the pronoun is designed to emulate a particular gender that is specific rather than being gender neutral, then, you know, there's definitely a case for any of these things to be used and to be valuable for that unique purpose. But I have a feeling that it's going to be easiest to explain they, them to people and that that's probably the one that's catching on the most overall. Um, so that's my forecast of the future, but I'm obviously going to be keeping track of this and it's, I still find it valuable to teach that these exist because there are still plenty of people, even people that I know who use them. Um, and so good to have awareness of that idea there. Okay. So that's pronoun gender. And like I said, we're going to talk about case a little bit later on. Okay, so pronouns. One thing that's really, really important about pronouns that I don't think, we talked about it once, but we haven't put it down in the notes. So this is something that we need to discuss here. Pronouns have antecedents. An antecedent, so anti means before. Think like, um, what's another word that we would know? Um, an antechamber is a room that comes before another room. Uh, so ante means to, you know, before, and seed means to, to, to come, to go, you know, to move. So an antecedent is literally what comes before a pronoun. It's built into the way that the word, word is. If that helps you remember it. Uh, an antecedent of a pronoun is the word the pronoun replaces. So for example, Jared is good at dually squelchers. He made a video about them recently. He doesn't make any sense if I don't talk about Jared first. If we just like cover that up on the screen and get rid of this, I think I can actually do that. Haha, -ha, you can't see it. He made a, a video about them recently. Oh, there's also another pronoun in there that I didn't even think about. Who made a video about what? We have no idea. This is an ambiguous sentence. There's context that we're missing, 
until we get this sentence earlier. So every time you write a pronoun, you need to be able to like draw an arrow back across somewhere earlier in your writing to talk about what it is that that word actually means. And if you can't do that, then that's not a time to be using a pronoun. All right. So we've done prepositions and pronouns. That leaves the the two easiest ones, probably. Um, besides maybe nouns. Nouns are probably the easiest, but. Uh, so let's start with interjections. Interjections have no grammatical function. They're just emotional exclamations. Ah! That was so scary. Wow. You're so scary. Golly gee willikers. That was so pleasant. Interjection, interjection, interjection. Um, but I, I lost a lot of my uh, old, uh, a lot of my old materials. But there was a, a lesson I did where I, I got a bunch of goofy interjections just, just as a, a fun little thing to help kids remember it. Um, and uh, the old Batman show, oh my goodness, that was just a wonderful source of these. Um, so we've got, holy purple cannibals, Batman. Holy priceless collection of uh, Etruscan snoods. They just, they just keep going, you know? You got golly gee willikers. You got, you know, you, you, can, you can be so creative with these. Great jumping Jehoshaphat. I think it's that, that's how it's spelled? No. Jehoshaphat. Okay. Um... Uh, is it normal to say a girl arrived? I don't know what they were doing. It feels more natural than she was doing. Um, it's, yeah, it's totally fine to do that as long as we're talking in the sense of, like, they, them being a third-person singular pronoun. Like, that that works. Um, there are some English teachers who will say, no, this is purely plural, but I think that they say that in ignorance of the politicization of these pronouns. So... I would, I would never correct someone for using the third person singular they, them in a paper or whatever. I think that's more effective, more accurate. Oftentimes, um, if somebody wants to be referred to by a particular pronoun, if they really like feel that that is an important part of their identity, then it might be valuable to use the, the gender of the pronoun that they ask you to. Um, but I have always seen they, them as a gender neutral pronoun. It is not an assertion that they are non-binary. It is an assertion that I'm just not going to gender this person with what I say. Um, there are probably others who see that pronoun differently than I do. And that's something to be aware of. And if they do see it differently than I do, Rather than telling them, oh, well, the English teacher said that this is the way. Remember, we're, formal English is so that you are understood and you can communicate effectively with people. If that's the way they see the language, then call them what they want to be called. Um, what if my pronouns are she, they? Well, you pick one or the other, you know, then they works just fine. Okay, so interjections are pretty easy to spot because a lot of the time in a sentence, they're just going to have an exclamation mark after them, and, and then, you, then you're going to move on, you know? These, you know, people can catch oftentimes more easily than they catch nouns. Not difficult. I'm going to move on from there. The next one is a little bit more complex because these can be confused with other things sometimes. These are conjunctions. Um, so conjunctions... 
there are a couple of different types of these, and we can't really talk about all of them yet because we need to talk about clauses first. But for now, we'll, we'll say that a conjunction is a word that combines two like words, phrases, or clauses. So a very common conjunction is and. Um, you can say Harry and Fred ate ice cream. And let's let's just say donuts. I, I like to use I would like to use ice cream, but donuts is just a single word, whereas ice cream is two words, and people will be like, wait, wait, uh, they don't recognize it's a compound noun, which is it's a little bit challenging sometimes when you're you know trying to break down every word and not realizing that some words are combinations of words. Anyway, Harry and Fred ate donuts. Normally in this sentence, you would only have room for a noun right here. You couldn't say Harry, Fred ate donuts. Unless uh, maybe it was Harry, comma, Fred ate donuts. Like you're getting Harry's attention. No, not that. If you just say Harry, and let's add another one. Harry, Fred, Sandra ate donuts. This doesn't make sense. This does not syntactically track. But all we really need to do is add a conjunction. Now all of a sudden, the, oh yeah, everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's fine, you know? Conjunctions make it so that you can fit in more than one of a word in a sen you know, in it's that one place in the sentence. But it's not just words, it can also be phrases. So for example, a blue cow and a pink cow were by the road. So now we've got two phrases, noun phrases, remember we talked about earlier, are noun plus all the words being modified by it, or the, all the words that are modifying it. Sorry, I worded that wrong. And the and is in between the two noun phrases. And what's a clause? Eh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, we're we're, we're going to get there. But having now talked about all of these, there are a couple of little things we want to add in there um, as kind of extra little bits. So a compound noun is a noun that consists of multiple different words. So ice cream, fire truck, these are words that you treat as a single noun because truck and fire truck are definitely two different ideas. Cream and ice cream are two different ideas. They have different meanings because they have those extra words in there, but we're just like, these are, these are just extra words. We're gonna just throw them in there to, to clarify them. You could make the argument that fire and ice are actually working as modifiers here, as adjectives, um, but since you, you couldn't put ice in front of, say, um, this is the ice lamp. Someone would be like, um, the what now? Is it, is it a lamp made out of ice? How, how is that safe? Um, this is fire cream. Like, what, what, what is that? Is, is that really spicy? Like, I, you can't take those and rearrange them necessarily. It's not like you can use that word to describe a variety of different things. It's just when you put ice in front of cream, it does this. And so we just call those compound nouns. Um, Next up, let's see. Is there anything else that we need to talk about before we get to... Um, for another example... Here is a preposition. And here's a way where we've got conjunction making it so that this preposition would normally just have, you know, the one noun phrase, but now it gets to have a second one because and is there. Um, so that's the sort of idea with conjunctions. We'll talk about different kinds of conjunctions and some more examples of them when we get to be able to talk about it later, when we have more context. But now, very exciting, we have finished talking about the eight parts of speech. So this part is all done. Next up, we've got to talk about rules in a sentence. 
So every word has a part of speech that it can play, and it's only going to play one of them at the same time. And roles in the sentence is the same way. Every word in a sentence also has a role in that sentence. Only certain parts of speech can play certain roles. So it's important that we talk about the parts of speech first, because in order for, say, a word to be the subject of the sentence, it needs to be a noun or pronoun. Uh, those are the only options that you've got available to you for the subject of the sentence. So let's start with this. Uh, what we really should start with is main verb. So we're going to go there first. Main verb. Every single sentence that has ever been written in the English language has a main verb. You can't say the same about just about any other word, any other role of the sentence, any other anything. But it always has a main verb by definition. It's got to have one. So in, let's say, Tommy... Oh, we're, we're going down too far. One second. I need to uh, take a look real quick. I had a line drawn you know, at the point where you guys can't see what I'm writing anymore. And that got erased. So now, now it should be fixed. Now I'll see that line and be like, oh, okay. I went too far down. So Tommy ate a donut. Main verb. Ate is the thing that is happening in that sentence. Yes, there are some specifics that are useful to know, but... If you were going to take this sentence and boil it down to one word, and that one word needed to represent what was happening, eight is definitely the best one. Tommy is just a person. Donut's just an object. But eight, that conveys what's going on. There's more information that you get out of the verb than anything else. So every single sentence needs a main verb in order to function. There can be more verbs, and we'll talk about how a little bit later on. But for now... Main verb is the most important part of the sentence here. Subject, the noun pronoun that does or is the main verb. Mm, or described by is better. So remember way back when we talked about verbs, how we were like, a verb can be an action verb or a state of being. It can be a thing you do, ate a donut, or it can be the way that something is. Jack feels unhappy. The subject is whatever noun or pronoun is either doing the action or it's their state of being that's being described. So a very basic sentence would be, um, Aditya ran. Aditya is our subject. Ran is our main verb. And between these two, we have a sentence. Um, as long as you've got those two things, it's going to work out. Now, there are some cases where you don't actually necessarily need a subject written out. And that is in the case of an imperative sentence. So this is a quick aside here. An imperative, an imperative sentence is a command. So if I look at you and point at you and say, leave i'm telling you to go away and it's implied who i'm talking to the way that you would break that down would be like this 
you, the, the subject of the sentence, is implied. I don't need to put it in there because it's clear just from the way that it's being said who it is that that's referring to. So, in that case, you can actually have a sentence that's written out without actually having the subject. And that's why I say that the main verb is more important. You cannot imply the main verb. That does not work. You can often imply the subject. So, all right. So, let's just throw modifiers in there because, uh, hey, hey, surprise. Uh, remember how I said that uh, modifiers isn't a part of speech, that it's actually uh, just, you know, a category of, of, of that adjectives and adge adverbs are in? Uh, well, uh, I lied. It, it's, it's a role in the sentence. It is uh, words that change other words. There. We've talked about modifiers again. So all of your adjectives and your adverbs that are just like linked on to another word, you just classify those as modifiers. Uh, prepositional phrases. We talked about these earlier. How down the street right here. that all of this just kind of serves to describe where she jumped. This is serving the function of a modifier overall. That is its role in the sentence. And you'd say that that whole phrase is a modifier. So that's about as complex as modifiers get. Usually, you know, okay, a hungry... Goober ate a delicious jelly donut greedily. There's, you can just break this down into, you know, main verb, subject, modifier, modifier. Um, we'll talk about what this is in a second, but this is a direct object. And then we've got modifier, 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 modifier. So many modifiers in here. These three words are the only ones you really need to like understand roughly what's going on. But there are a bunch of modifiers attached and being able to kind of parse those out and figure out, okay, these words, they're not really that important. They add some information, but like if I want to understand the bare bones structure of what the sentence is, I don't need to worry about them too much. Um, okay, so modifiers. Then we get into all of the objects. So we're gonna have direct object, indirect object. I will put some space because this is actually going to go someplace else. Um, oh yeah, we need object complements. Those are brutal. Uh, and then these are gonna be an odd one out, but throw in there okay so we've got all these um we've got object or prepositions that was subject main verb modifier one two three one two three there's one i'm missing might just be interjections oh conjunctions conjunctions right Okay, we'll, we'll worry about the, those for now. Uh, mm, now nah, we'll worry about that when we get to clauses. We'll just stick with these for now. I don't think there's anything else we need to worry about. Okay, so in this sentence, remember we broke it down to subject, main verb, and there's this other noun that's right out here on its lonesome. This is a direct object. So a direct object is what is acted on by a subject with an action verb. So the donut is what's being eaten by the goober. If we're eating specifically the donut, then the donut is the direct object of the sentence or of the clause. Well, we'll talk about clauses later. So, of the sentence, for now. Um, 
So we ate what? We ate the donut. If you can answer like what or who the verb is being done to, it's probably a direct object. An indirect object is a little bit sneakier. What the action is being done to or for. So let's say it's not we ate a donut. Instead of ate a jelly donut greedily, they gave Jem a jelly donut generously. So now we've still got gave is our main verb. Goober is still our subject, but we know what this means intuitively, that I am receiving the donut here. If we didn't have the word donut, so let's just get rid of this entire noun phrase. Let's read what this looks like. A hungry goover gave gem generously. I am now being given. I am now a possession. This is slavery. That's not, that's not what we're going for here. If there are two nouns like this, one of those cannot be a direct object. It does not make to call that a direct object. The direct object is, again, what's being given. So the donut is what's transferring from one person to another. The person that it's being given to is the indirect object. So when you've got two nouns after an action verb like that, and there's no other clear reason for them to be there, you're probably looking at indirect object followed by direct object. And you cannot reverse these either. If you put these in the wrong order, you once again get a case of slavery, where uh, a, a hungry goober, goober gave a delicious jelly donut gem. I am being gifted to the donut there. That's no bueno. We're not cool with that. It's not how we roll in this society. Don't give people up to donuts. So that's indirect object versus direct object. Now, you'll notice that I've used acted, action. I'm talking about an action verb. Remember, oh, we need to get rid of the that stuff. Okay. Remember way up here where we talked about action verb versus state of being verb? This is where this becomes really important. Because when you look at a sentence, you're going to look at the verb first, because that's the only thing that you know for sure is going to be there. And the way the puzzle works is that we, you know, find the verb. So let's say... Um, uh, no. Okay, purple cow threw Sonic the Hedgehog a football somehow. I don't know how a cow throws a football, but you know what? I'll just leave that to your imaginations. So we're going to start with through because through is our main verb. It's the only verb in the sentence. And from here, the way that you break this down is you're like, okay, there's going to be a main verb for sure. Now, where's the subject of that verb? Well, it's cow. Cow is what's doing the throwing. After you've got those two locked down, now you start figuring out other things relative to them. So like, purple, what's it doing? Oh, it's telling us what kind of cow. The is telling us which cow. And then Sonic the Hedgehog, that's another noun. We haven't identified that yet. Football, that's another noun. We haven't identified that yet. And so this is the way that you start to figure out, like, what are these nouns actually doing? If it's an action verb like through... Now we're looking for our object, direct object or indirect object kind of idea. Um, so from here, we're like, okay, are we throwing a football? Is that what's, what's actually going through the air? Yes. So that's direct object. And that means that Sonic the Hedgehog is what the football is being thrown to or for based on this syntax. And yes, that actually does make sense. But there are other possibilities here. And we're going to talk about those next. One of those is an object complement, which is this one. If you want to melt the mind of an 11 year old, try to teach them what an object complement is. This one's just kind of brutal. 
Um, this one is pretty poorly understood. Um, so... Hmm. I can think of one that's adjectival. Okay, I've got it. Okay. So, same situation we were just in. We're going to look for a main verb first. We're going to look for subject. What is doing the making? It's the run. It's doing the making. And then we look over here, and we go, okay. We've got noun here in jelly, noun here in legs. But the same logic we just used earlier doesn't really work here. We're not making a jelly for my legs. We're not, like, gifting to my legs this jelly or something. Like... That doesn't really fit. That's not what the meaning of the sentence is. It's that the legs are turning into jelly. Like, we are making jelly out of the legs that we have. So this is where we've got an object complement. What's actually being acted on here are the legs. So the legs are a direct object. That's what's being made into something else. And the something else that they're made into, what they're renamed to is an object complement or original content. You know, you, I, I see you fan fiction people out there. So whenever you run into this situation where you've got action verb and then you've got like two nouns after that, you're still not sure exactly what you're looking at. You still have to ask some questions of that situation. So remember, direct object is what's being directly acted on by the verb. An indirect object is what that action is being done to or for, you know, for whose benefit is that happening? Whereas an object complement is what the direct object is being renamed to or remade into. A direct object will come after an indirect object, but before an object complement. And you can't have an indirect object and an object complement in the same sentence. Um, like, if I just add this in here... Um, just add like another random noun, I guess, or maybe make it so that it's, it's fill his legs jelly. Like none of this fits, none of this works. You, we as English speakers look at this and we go, I've never seen a sentence that's written like that. Um, you're either gonna have an indirect object or an object complement, never both. So what a direct object is renamed slash remade into. Uh, another great example of this would be um, they call me Jim. Me is the direct object. I'm who is being called, but I'm being called this. This is the thing that I am being renamed as. So... Hopefully that helps a little bit there. Okay. So th this is the part where, you know, you, you start losing people pretty quick. Because, <laughs> you know, if someone wasn't paying attention to any of this earlier stuff, didn't get any of this earlier stuff down there, and I was like, oh, we already learned this. Uh, that This is where that starts really biting them in the butt. This is where you start to run into some problems. Predicate nominative and predicate adjective. Who joy, who boy, who golly gee willikers. This is going to be fun. So... Predicate nominative is a noun that the subject is being renamed, remade into by a linking verb. We haven't talked about that term yet. We're going to go back and talk about this in just a second. But an adjective that the subject is being attached to, I, I guess I'll say, by the linking verb. What's a linking verb? Let's scroll all the way back up to verbs for a second here. So action verbs are going to be action verbs. There are a few different kinds of those, and we'll talk about those. Actually, let's talk about those now, because we just talked about 
the concept that applies to these. So, transitive, intransitive has an object, does not have an object, and then there's also ditransitive has two objects. This is very easy to understand when you start looking at the prefixes. Transitive, okay, so that has something to do with objects. In transitive, well, if transitive had to do with objects, in must be the opposite, doesn't have an object. Die transitive, die means two. So that means we have two objects. So if you have a direct object, then you have a transitive verb. If you have a direct object and an indirect object, that's ditransitive. Same deal if you've got a direct object with an object complement. And then an intransitive verb is one where you don't have an object. So for example, Jem ran. Did I run something? Did I, did I like run a show? Did I run a computer? Did I run, you know, the, the meeting? No, I just ran. It doesn't need an object. There's not something that I'm doing running to. I'm just running. So that's what an intransitive verb would be. And when you look things up in the dictionary, when you find a verb, it's going to tell you if it's transitive or intransitive or anything like that. Um, and that's to help you understand how it should be used. Is this a verb that needs to have an object? So for example, let's see, what's an example of a verb that needs to be transitive? Um, portrayed. If I portray something, there needs to be a something I'm portraying. I can't just, I portray. What, what, you portray what? Get, get on with it. Finish your sentence. You know, there, there's that lingering like expectation. And that's because there's a word missing. That's because that's a transitive verb. That's a verb that's going to have an object every time you use it. So that's what those words mean. And then state of being verbs... We've got two kinds, and they can be tricky to tell apart sometimes. So a linking verb is a main verb that's a state of being verb. A helping verb is, uh, this is also called an auxiliary verb, so I'll add that in, is a verb that adds something is some extra information about how to understand the main verb in a sentence alone. What's confusing is that words that can be linking verbs can often also be helping or auxiliary verbs. Now, like we talked about before, it's never going to be both at the same time, but for example, is. Let's take is for a second and, and go down here and get an example of this. This is a sentence that occurs in a William Faulkner novel. Um, it's abstract, obviously, but uh, we're Splatoon players, so for some of us, this might just be literal. Now, this is our verb. This is not an action. Just existing is not an action that you're taking. It's just a state of being. It's the way that you currently are. Mother and fish are being shown to be the same thing using this verb. So this is our main verb, and this is still going to be our subject. But this is not a direct object. It's not that my mother is doing something to the fish. My mother is the fish. So we don't call this a do. It's not a direct object. It's a predicate nominative. It's a noun that the subject, mother, is being renamed or remade into by a linking verb, which is is. A linking verb will always be the main verb. A helping verb will always not be. Let's change this up for a second to say, my mother is helping a fish. So now, we still have the word is, right? But we also have the verb helping, and helping is the main thing that's going on in the sentence here. Is is only there as a helping verb 
that gives us information about the verb tense of helping. It tells us this is happening now. It, it's not that it was happening earlier, it's happening now currently, like it's ongoing. That's information that we get out of this helping verb. Also notice that because the main verb became an action verb when we added that in here, now mother and fish are not being linked together. They're not the same thing anymore. We could change that. What we could do is say that my mother is being a fish. Now mother and fish are still the same, but again, being is now the main verb. And it's a state of being verb now. It's a linking verb. But is it still going to be a helping verb on top of it either way? So. In I like donuts, I is performing the action like to the object of donuts. Yes, that would be a good way to put it. Would helping be the main verb in my mother is helping? Correct. One thing that you will find as you construct more and more complicated, you know, verb phrases, which is what we call this whole package right here, is that the main verb will always be the last one. So you're always going to have main verb here, and then all of the helping verbs come before it. So and you can get some really confusing combinations of helping verbs in the English language. Like not every uh, language is like this, but you could say something like, my teacher could have been being distracted. So now It's going to, you know, flag this. This is syntactically correct. It's not stylistically a great way to put this. But being would be the main verb. And then you've got been is a helping verb. Have is a helping verb. And could is a helping verb. Then actually, no, no wait, 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 hold on. Been being, mm, depends on whether we want to consider this a predicate adjective as in a participle or whether we want to consider it the main verb. I think both interpretations are valid. We haven't talked about participles yet. So for our purposes right now, we're going to consider it a predicate adjective because that's what we understand. Um, but yeah, so this is the way that that's always going to be. And it's always going to be the last one that is your main verb. So hopefully that helps you with identifying those if you ever have to in a, in, for important reasons, I guess. Okay. So we have now uh, finished talking about verbs, I believe, probably for good. That's, a, that's our whole verb flow chart there. That's how we figure out what kind of verb we're looking at. So predicate nominative is linking verb, combining this thing with this noun. Predicate adjective is almost the same thing, but is kind. Now, instead of this thing being a noun, this thing is just an adjective. So it's still a thing that my mother is. My mother is kind. But instead of being a noun, which would be a predicate nominative, it is an adjective. So it's a predicate adjective. So remember this word nominative? Ta-da! Here it is. Uh, that's for a reason. And we'll get to that in just a second. We just need to get through a few more of these. Actually, literally just one more of these, which is the object of a preposition. Um, so back when we talked about prepositional phrases over here, we said that there's a preposition followed by a noun phrase that's being turned into a modifier. It's really important to spot uh, you know, prepositions and prepositional phrases and get them out of there. Because remember how we talked about, you know, a uh, uh, funky cow ate some delicious hay. All we really need to know about this sentence is cow ate hay. Those are the only words that really like tell us what's going on and everything else is just like some, some extra description here. Um, and so, you know, that part of the, the reason we want to know about modifiers is so that we can just be like, oh, we don't need to worry about those. The words that we actually need to worry about are this, this, and this. 
And that's how we find the structure of this sentence the easiest. Same kind of deal with prepositions, um, and it's especially important with objects of a preposition. Because remember all that, that mess we got into with the nouns that follow a verb, with indirect objects and object complements? If you see an object of a preposition and you don't spot it, you might accidentally think that you're looking at something like a, an indirect object or an object complement. Um, so object of a preposition is the noun that a preposition is turning into a modifier. So in into the woods, woods is the object of the preposition here. And so now when we say um, Jimmy threw a football into the woods, what's going on is we're not throwing to a football the woods, right? We're not giving the woods to the football here. That doesn't make any sense. We couldn't do that if we tried. That does So if you try to interpret this as, oh, hey, there's, there's two nouns that follow an action verb, so this must be an indirect object. This must be... No, 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 that doesn't work. What's happening here is you're missing that there was a preposition right here that's stealing this noun. This noun is, is, is it's not there. This is all just a modifier on through. Don't worry about any of this. Scribble it out in your mind. Okay, that was maybe a little too much scribbling. We, we obscured some important things there. But all we really need, need to worry about for the purpose of understanding the structure of the sentence is Jimmy threw football. And then we're good. Okay. So let's scroll up here and talk about pronoun case now. It is later. We are now talking about it. And we'll throw in reflexive and intensive just for, for giggles. So the nominative case is pronouns playing the role of the subject or predicate nominative. We couldn't talk about case yet because in order to understand what case a pronoun is serving as, we need to know what role in the sentence the pronoun is serving as. So now that we know those things, here's what we can do. I you see I, it's going to be either the subject of a sentence or a predicate nominative. And I will say this also, I think that the predicate nominative part of that is starting to go out of fashion. Um, people do not say it is I anymore. That's the formal way that, you know, according to proper English, you're supposed to do it. Um, because it's a nominative pronoun, and that's a predicate nominative. But these days people probably won't use that construction at all. Um, and so I have a feeling that that is going to become archaic, that that's going to become something that nobody uses. So mostly just the subject here. Then objective. So bear with me here, because this is, this is going to be complicated, okay? The, the ob objective case is pronouns that are a direct object an indirect object, an object complement, a object of a preposition. Oh man, I wonder how I'm ever going to remember those. Hmm. You see me instead of I in a sentence, you know me is some kind of object there. So you know you've got there's gotta be some kind of action verb. There's got to be some sort, or, or also it could be a preposition. For me? Like so. Now, possessive is going to be pronouns that show ownership. They function as modifiers or as anything that a any sorry role that a noun can play 
So these ones are a little bit different. Uh, we look at my and mine, for example. So shout outs to the 100 gex. Um, we've got my here, which is a possessive pronoun. If we don't know who the speaker is, then there's no antecedent to the word my. So remember, pronouns need their antecedents. They need the word that comes before them for you to understand what this means. But once we know who that is, it's that person, and then we are, uh, we are to understand that the truck belongs to them. So in this case, my is a modifier. It's telling us which truck? My truck, in particular. Now, when we move over to this one, it's a little bit different. Than, in this case, is being used as a preposition. And so yours is the object of that preposition. Yours, again, is going to refer to the speaker. And here, yours is that any role that a noun can play version. Um, this is why we have two different versions of it. Because if we swapped this around, this would be your truck is very big. It is bigger than mine. So with all of the possessive pronouns, there are going to be two different versions. There's going to be the adjective form and the noun form. The adjective form is always going to be that modifier. The noun form could do whatever the heck you want it to do, as long as there's an antecedent for it. So those are possessive pronouns. Then reflexive pronouns and intensive pronouns are all both made using the same construction. So, insert pronoun here, self. So, for example, himself, herself, itself, myself, all of those self pronouns. But they're used in two different ways. So, reflexive is a self pronoun where that just acts as a noun. An intensive pronoun is a self-pronoun that emphasizes its antecedent. Thank you for the donation, Quoth Silrock. Uh, did you or YouTube remove the ability to gift memberships? I don't think I did. Um, I've never done it myself, to be honest, so I don't actually even know where the button is to begin with. Um, and the version of my channel that I would go see if I went to it would look different. So I've, if someone wanted to do that, then they would have to experiment because I couldn't help them out too much. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, okay, so here's the difference. Um, Um, so here we have the, the sentence, I hit myself, boom. Myself is what is being hit. Um, we are like acting on ourselves when we have a reflexive pronoun. So here, myself is actually a direct object. When it says, I did the work myself, like, let's do the analysis that we did before on the, the different nouns that are here. So, main verb, subject, so I am what's doing, work is what's being done, so that's a direct object. Now, we've got this other noun floating out there, right? It can't be an indirect object, because it's after a direct object. Can't be an object complement, though, because we're not making the work into myself, so what is this? This is an intensive pronoun. Um, I and myself are considered both a part of the subject. You could say, I myself did the work, and that would still be, you know, understandable. Um, I'm not sure if that's, you know, orthodox, but that's something that people do say sometimes. So it's just kind of a rep repetition of the subject is what you would consider an intensive pronoun to be.
So we'll label these examples here. In case we ever come back to them. I don't know if we're going to do that, but they're there now. Okay. So we have now talked about most of the roles in the sentence. There are going to be a few more, unfortunately. Um, and that's because we haven't talked yet about clauses. So a clause is a subject and main verb with all of their associated complements and modifiers. So this category right here. So all of the different kinds of objects we talked about and then predicate nominatives and predicate adjectives, we consider those to be complements. Um, they're something that, you know, something that can come after a verb, basically. Um, that can be like a, a thing or something that's directly interacting with subject and main verb in that way. So you take a subject and you take a main verb and you take all the modifiers that are attached onto that, whether those be prepositional phrases, whether those be, you know, adjectives or adverbs modifying them. You throw all that together in one chunk and you've got a clause. So a sentence must consist of one and what we'll call independent clause. It can, however, have any number of other independent clauses or dependent clauses. So let's start with independent so that we can then talk about what a dependent clause is. An independent clause is a strong independent clause that don't need no other clause. It kind of breaks down at that point. Um, a clause that has enough information to be its own sentence by itself. So every single example that we've used so far has consisted of one independent clause, except for one that I talked about earlier that I was like, wait, this is a bad example and I didn't use anymore. So a Uber ate a donut. I always go back to donuts, like I said. This is an independent clause. It has main verb, subject, modifier, modifier, has a direct object, that's a complement. All of these fit the description of an independent clause. But and donut and another goober another donut eh. Eat, uh, pie there now we're mixing things up because eight here is definitely a main verb eight here is also a main verb they each have subjects they each have direct objects Got a couple modifiers there and a couple modifiers there. And you can have multiple of these in the same sentence. There are a few different ways that we can combine them and we'll talk about that in just a second. First, we have to talk about what a dependent clause is though. So let's get rid of all of this. Uh, I should probably not have that pluralized, huh? Okay. A clause that cannot have a complete meaning without a clarifying independent clause. So, because, oops, because I ate a donut, This is not a sentence. This can't stand on its own. Because 
you're looking at this sentence, you're like, okay, what happened because I ate a donut? Well, what... You, there's more information that I'm waiting for here. As, you know, just a native English speaker, you know intuitively that this is missing something. And the something that it is missing syntactically is an independent clause. I felt really great on my run later that day. And we'll punctuate that one with a smiley face because we're being sarcastic. Now that we have this right here, this makes sense. And notice that this is a complete sentence. It is an independent clause. So I felt great is a predicate adjective. We've got the subject I, modifier, prep phrase, um, and then we'll just call later that day to all be a big adverb and not worry about it too much. Um, let, let's cut out that day and not worry about that for now. If we were to get rid of because I ate a donut, this sentence still stands on its own. I felt really great on my run later. Maybe a little confusing that we say later because we don't know what that's in reference to, but that's more a problem of the meaning of the sentence than its syntax being off. So we need this, which is independent, in order for this to work. So that's the difference between an independent and a dependent clause. Now, this is the part where we get our extra roles in the sentence because one important role in the sentence is introducing a new clause if you have multiple of them. So you saw the first way that I did this was by using a conjunction. So um, it was a goober ate a donut and another goober eight a pie. This right here, comma and, is the culprit here. This is what's allowing us to take this clause and shove it next to this clause and call them both a sentence together. This is the coupling. So for two independent clauses, We can use comma followed by coordinating conjunction. What's a coordinating conjunction? Well, I'm glad you asked, dear listener. Let's go all the way back up to our conjunctions. And let's add some subtypes. So the coordinating conjunctions combine two independent clauses. And the nice thing about the coordinating conjunctions is that we actually have a really useful mnemonic device for them. Um, hello? There we go, thank you. And that mnemonic device is fanboys. Holy moly, Pukas, thank you so much. Holy crap. That is possibly one of the largest donations that I've ever personally received. Thank you so much. I just want you to know that I have a huge respect for your highly perceptive and intelligent view on science, psychology, and linguistics, etc. The fact that you can nerd out about something you find valuable, even though it has nothing to do with the context of your channel, is commendable. Thank you. Thank you. That is so kind of you. Holy crap. Wow. Um, cool. Well. Um, okay. Fanboys. Uh, coordinated conjunctions. Um, so the fanboys are for and nor but or yet and so these are pretty much all of the ones that you're going to see being used as a coordinating conjunction some of them are pretty archaic too some of them you're not going to see very often so for example 
Um, I must flee, for I am, I am a coward. People these days are just going to use because. People, people are not going to try to make a coordinating conjunction kind of statement out of this. They're just going to make this into a subordinate clause. But this is, you know, grammatically, uh, you know, correct. There's no syntactical problem here. Um, we've already seen and. I do not like you, nor do I like your mother. So nor can be used to say the first thing was no and the second thing is also no. Then we've got but, which is the first thing is one way, but the other thing is a different way. So I do not like you, but I do like your mother. Um, and then we've got or, which means one or the other is the thing. I cannot, uh, let's skip that. That's going to get, get too complicated. Uh, I eat cheese or I eat donuts. So they either eat one thing or the other. They can do one or the other, but not both. Yet is very similar to but in that this thing, but also this thing. Uh, I do not like you, yet I like your mother. And then so, I do not like you, so I hope you step on a Lego. Um, and so here shows causality. It shows this is the cause and this is the effect. And that's about it. Those are all the coordinating conjunctions. They're actually memorizable, thankfully. Um, just remember fanboys, for and nor, but or yet so. There you go, you got them. Now, there's another kind of conjunction because we've combined two independent clauses. But now we've got to go from... Actually, no, I skipped a step here. So that's one way that we can combine two independent clauses. Or, <laughs> you see what I did there. <laughs> or, all your semicolon questions. We've finally come to the point in grammar instruction where we can explain what the heck that thing does. It takes this long to get to just explaining what the heck a semicolon does. This long in the unit. This is why nobody knows how this thing works. Because you have to learn all of these other things. And if any step of this process fails, up until the point that we get to understanding different types of clauses and combining them, that's how long it takes to understand this. So, it's understandable that nobody knows this. It, that, that's, that's why that, that's such a problem for all these different people. Um, but this is what a semicolon does. It allows you to go from one independent clause to another independent clause without having to end the sentence. Now, if you're going to do that, there's a very particular reason to. Because one might astutely ask, okay, wait, so I can just not put periods there and put a semicolon instead? No. There needs to be more of a connection between those two clauses than you would want to separate with a period. Here's a, 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 actually a pretty good example. Um, so... Voted for representative... Pemsley. Sounds like a very representative name. Shannon is not very smart. Then Shannon voted for representative Pemsley. Pemsley. 
Shannon is not very smart. These two sentences could, or sorry, two combinations of words, I guess, mean different things. This could just be that we're listing things about Shannon. We could just go on to say Shannon's favorite color is orange. Shannon has a cat named Peter. All of these things don't have to be connected. But if we put a semicolon, there's a connection between Shannon not being smart and Shannon voting for Representative Pemsley. Now, from this construction, we are saying we can conclude that Shannon's not very smart from the premise that she voted for this person. This is a comment on Representative Pemsley. Here, these could just be two statements that are unconnected to each other. But once we put the semicolon in, they have to be connected. Got another example here. Um, the... Here, when we use the semicolon, it is implied that the reason that the state fair was canceled is that the chickens got loose and started pecking people. If we put these as two separate sentences, there doesn't necessarily exist that implication between the two of them. This is why you use semicolons, to create that sort of connection between those two clauses. All right. So... One really common uh, problem that, that I see people mentioning in the chat is comma splices, so we'll talk about that really quickly. A comma splice is an error. This is a really common mistake that people make. A comma splice happens when you're trying to combine two independent clauses, but all you do is put a comma. Hello. No, not that one. Can we just... Oh my god. This... The buttons that I am pressing to get this to happen make no sense at all. Holy mackerel. Okay, finally. That was th the most frustrating combinations of buttons that I've, I've pressed in a while, and I play Splatoon. Okay, um, combining two independent clauses using only a comma, not using the methods described earlier... This is an error. Do not do this. So, for example, uh, the Cubs won the World Series. Um, People were surprised. There. This would be considered grammatically unsound because these are two independent clauses that are not sufficiently linked. Um, we need maybe a coordinating conjunction after this comma, or we could put a semicolon there, or, you know, a lot of the time it actually works better to just put them as two separate sentences, you know, depending on how the mistake was made, because, I mean, people aren't always going to be accurate in, in all ways but one, you know? People make multiple errors at a time, so sometimes it might just be better to do that. Those are your ways to fix a comma splice. But we haven't talked about independent clauses to... Or actually, really, we just need to talk about introducing dependent clauses. Because whether we're combining an independent clause to a dependent clause, or whether we've got two different dependent clauses that are being strung together, they're going to be introduced largely in the same kinds of ways. Um, this, uh, let's see. We're not going to worry about a noun clause just yet. Because those, those get a little bit 
tricky, and we might want to talk about verbals first, but yeah, well, so dependent clauses you're going to introduce in one of two ways, using a subordinating conjunction or a relative pronoun. So remember earlier when we used that word because and where if we blacked out the end of the sentence, we're left hanging there, we're waiting for this to conclude. If we take out the word because here, it doesn't work that way anymore. We just have a sentence. It was adding because that subordinated this clause that made it dependent. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, I forgot to... <laughs> whoops. Oopsie daisies. There's another word for a dependent clause, which is a subordinate clause. Um, so a subordinate you know, is something lower in the hierarchy. Your subordinate is maybe someone who works for you or someone you outrank. Um, and so a subordinating conjunction is a conjunction. Remember, something a conjunction conjoins things. A conjunction that links a clause to another clause by making one of them need the other one, depend on the other one. That's why we have dependent. So that's what subordinating conjunctions do. Uh, and with subordinating conjunctions, you don't need a comma necessarily. Um, like we can see here, we were able to just start a sentence with it. Or you could say, people were surprised because Cubs won the World Series. And the reason that we're able to do this is because... <laughs> um, this clause depends on the rest of the sentence, and so you can't separate them, you know? Putting a comma right here would be like, would be like, you know, just se separating uh, a mama bear from the baby bear. And you know how that works uh, with you getting eaten. So d don't do that. Um, just, just keep the cubs with their parents. I, okay, that, that, I guess that's why I'm thinking about bears. Um, so that's why that is the way that it is. Uh, and then the other way is a special kind of pronoun that we have not talked about yet because it's not something we're going to be doing um, a bunch of like person, number, gender, case stuff with. It's a special kind of pronoun that's only really used in these kinds of situations. So let's take a look at this sentence that I'm about to make up off the top of my head right now. Brilliance. Poetry. Okay. Let's break this down the way that we've been breaking into, uh, you know, things down so far. So we're looking for main verbs first. So ate is going to be a main verb. And then was is also going to be a main verb. So because we have two main verbs, we know we have two clauses. That's just the way that we can figure that out by just spotting how many verbs there are. Even if there's an implied subject, we know at least by counting the verbs that we know how many clauses we have to deal with. So, next thing we'll, we'll want to do is go and find the subjects of these main verbs. So, I ate the donut, and then which? Which is being shown to be delicious. We've got a linking verb in was, and delicious is going to be a predicate adjective. Well, the only thing that we can say was delicious that isn't already taken, because we're, the donut's over here in the other clause, so it's not allowed to come over. All we've got left is which. But hold on. Which is a pronoun, right? Which means it has an antecedent. It has a thing that it's talking about earlier. And you know what that thing is earlier? Donut. Donut and which are the same thing. It's the donut that was delicious. That's how a relative pronoun can take this clause, which was delicious, because this is subordinate. If you just cover up I ate a donut here, We're missing information. 
which was delicious. What was delicious? We don't know. We're missing information that's not a complete sentence yet. It's a complete sentence once we allow this to be here and the pronoun which gets its antecedent back. So what you're basically doing is linking the two clauses by carrying one word over from the previous clause into the next one. That's how that works. So that's relative pronouns for you. Oops. So we'll say definitions here. Subordinating conjunction and relative pronoun. Forgive my relative frugality compared to Lord Pukas. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Nobody's, nobody's required to donate or anything like that. Love the stream topic. We'll rewatch later. Fueled by coffee rather than tequila when it has been cataloged for posterity. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I definitely don't recommend that my students show up to class drunk. Um, that would probably impede their ability to, to retain the information. <laughs> no, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Okay. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum. Subordinating conjunction. Okay. So this is a conjunction that takes what could be an independent clause and makes it dependent slash subordinate. Oh my God, it's gonna do the thing again. There, I figured out what I need to do with that. I need to press the enter key. And then a relative pronoun is a pronoun. So here's where it's important to remember your parts of speech. We've got conjunction versus pronoun here which links one clause to another by serving a role in one clause while having its antecedent in the other clause. When I talk about, oops, we're gonna do this. There we go. And then we're gonna do this, perfect. So when we talk about telling a relative pronoun apart from a subordinating conjunction, the easiest way to tell them apart in a sentence, if you just don't happen to have it memorized what all of the subordinating conjunctions are, is to look at the thing and go, does this word serve a role in the sentence outside of just being glue, being a conjunction. So when I look at, I eat because I care. I don't know what that means. I'll let you interpret that, but because, is this doing anything in either of the two clauses or is it just there as kind of a bridge between the two? It's not really anything else that it means, but if I say, I eat what I like, got main verb, got subject, got main verb, got subject. And this is going to be a little weird because we've talked about word order before and how the direct object needs to go after the main verb, but what is actually the direct object? If you were to take this clause right here and work it out, it would go, I like what? I eat what I like. I eat, I like what? So that's gonna be a direct object there. And so because it serves a role in the sentence, you know, you can't, you can't say like, I care because. I care all of the becauses. That doesn't really make any sense, right? It's not serving another role in the sentence. It's not doing what a pronoun normally does. So this is a conjunction, whereas this is a relative pronoun. And that's how we get the, the, those differences there. Okay. I think we can 
move on from there. Okay. Before we get into verbals, which are evil, let's talk first about... Uh, hello. Please no. Let's talk first about the function of subordinate clauses. Subordinate clauses act as either adjectives, adverbs, or nouns. And this is where you catch all the kids who weren't paying attention on day one when they thought that this class was going to be easy and didn't take this stuff down in their notes. Because it's still, we're still talking about it and we're going to keep talking about it. So, it's because I care. This is a subordinate clause. What's it doing in the sentence though? Here, we finally found an example for the ad... Ooh. I forget that this does not scroll independently here. We finally found an example for the adverb question, why? This clause is adverbial. That is, it's acting as an adverb. It's not a scary word, but it, you just think about what it means for a second. And it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. This is an adverb clause because it is modifying eat. Then, Here, independent clause, subordinate clause. And that jumps off the lamp and lands on the roof is all talking about which cat. Or maybe what kind of cat. Probably which cat. You know, makes the most sense there. So all of this is going to tell us more about the word cat. And then... So, and we'll, we'll write this out instead of using the contraction just for the sake of showing stuff. Uh, so, so, can we not, please? So, subordinate clause. And we have main verb. Not is considered an adverb, so this is just a modifier. That's it's something that people often confuse for a helping verb, um, but it's actually an adverb, so just in case you were confused there. Do is going to be a helping verb. I is a subject here. What is it that we do not like? All of this. All of this right here, this noun clause is the direct object. What role in the sentence is this noun clause serving? Direct object. So a clause can do anything that a noun can do. Which leads to some pretty complicated constructions sometimes, but that's how that works. So. And then... There it is. Okay. Boink, boink, boink. Okay, now we're going to get to verbals. Verbals are evil. Verbals are something that we should not teach middle school children because it's just cruel and unusual punishment. Um, but I've had to do so in the past, and so, well, here we are. 
Verbals are cases in which a verb phrase functions as something that's not what a verb normally does. We have three kinds. Gerunds, infinitives, and participles. So, gerunds are when a verb, verb phrase, actually, we'll just say gerund slash gerund phrase. Because a gerund is a verb that has this characteristic. A gerund phrase is a verb phrase that has this characteristic. Whatever. Um, that acts as a noun. Infinitives are two, insert verb here, constructions that act as adjectives or nouns. And then participles are, we should probably talk about principal parts first. We'll do that in a second. Um, so participles are progressive forms of verbs used as adjectives. Okay. Um, I am going to say these things and then maybe I need to come back to them. Hmm. Actually, it's not necessarily progressive. Let's just say, stick it like this for now. And then come back to it. Because I'm, I'm, I don't want to like cut off our momentum here, right? When we're talking about this confusing subject. So. Let's take a look at this construction right here to understand the confusion that happens when you give a sentence with a verbal in it to a student who has not learned about verbals. So we're going to be a good student here, and we're going to find that riding is going to be one main verb, that is is going to be another main verb. And then we're going to look over here, and the next thing we're going to start doing is we're going to look for the subjects of these verbs. And we're immediately going to melt our brains doing that because there's an error here in our, our, our understanding of syntax. Um, this is the point where if you hadn't programmed a computer to know about verbals, it would spit out an error message because there's no noun that comes before writing. Who's doing the writing? It's not even clear. And in fact, the sentence doesn't even require us to know who's doing the writing. So I don't know where that subject is. Uh, and then is. What is difficult? Bike is difficult? Not exactly. It's, it's the riding part that's difficult. Bike just is. Like, how can you say that a bicycle is difficult? Like, is it, is it talking back to you or something? That doesn't make sense. Riding makes a lot more sense as the direct object of bike. What's being ridden, the bike is. So we're very confused because neither of these verbs have subjects and they don't even have really, like, clear subjects until... We look at this and say, wait, we can have gerund phrases. Here's what the gerund phrase lets us do. This right here, riding a bike, it's not a part of a clause. This is a gerund phrase. And remember, it acts as a noun. So this verb right here that needed a subject, the subject is this verb phrase. Riding a bike is the subject. It is what is difficult. And so now it's just a simple subject, main verb, predicate adjective. And we don't say main verb about this anymore because it's not the verb that's a part of the clause there. We call this a gerund. So the way that you find verbals <laughs> is by understanding everything that we've already done well enough to recognize that the sentence doesn't make sense until one of those extra verbs there needs to be doing one of these other things that a verb can do. 
truly evil. So that's gerunds. Infinitives can do a very similar thing. So what an infinitive does is it just uses this version of the verb. To ride a bike is difficult. So it's doing effectively the same thing that the gerund is here, but we're using this form of the verb, to ride, which is the infinitive form of the verb. And that's something we should have talked about just before we got into this, and I'll go back to and talk about in just a second. So hold your thoughts on that. And then participles would say maybe something like, um, ba -da 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 -da. Jim riding a bike. hurt himself, let's say. Um, uh, riding a bike, hit a pole. That's more fun, more, 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 more visual. Anyway, um, riding a bike here is the confusing part here. Because Jim is definitely riding a bike, but Jim also hit a pole. Like if, if we don't have Jim as the subject for hit, then what can hit be doing? But riding a bike, if we label this as a participle, or a participial phrase is what this would be, can just be seen as a modifier on Jim. You know, Jim, the riding a bike Jim, hit a pole. And now this all works out pretty nicely. So those are verbals. Those are really, really fun and exciting. And what I probably should have talked about first was the principal parts of the verb. So some of you who are, you know, checking off all of your boxes of English language things you know are probably re recognizing I haven't talked about verb tense yet. Uh, and that's because we need to talk about how you build verb tenses. Um, so let's first talk about the principal parts of the verb. There are four different forms that a verb can take in the English language. There is the infinitive form. There is the participle form. There is the past participle. And then there is the, wait a minute. No, that's incorrect. It's, I believe it's simple present, simple past. And then, okay, so flu. So it's fly, flu, to fly, and flying. I'm forgetting what the name of that is. Hold on. And this is where practice. I wasn't looking for that. I was just looking for the, the thing. So we consider it present, present participle, past, past participle. Okay. Oh, right. Simple past is okay. The simple is verb tenses, right? Okay. So there's present parts. Simple present, simple past, and then, hold on, what were the four that I listed there? Felt like that list left something out. Oh, okay, there's four beyond, oh, okay, okay, okay. So infinitive is not counted as one of them. That's what was throwing me there. Okay. I was getting some of these confused with verb tenses. And yeah, okay. We're going to create a chart here real quick. Infinitive. Simple present. Simple past. Present participle. And past participle. So, let's take... To call. 
So the simple present is going to be call. Simple past is going to be called. Present participle is going to be calling. And the past, past participle is often the same as the simple past. But sometimes you get irregular ones. Um, you define an irregular verb as a verb where the simple past and the past participle are actually different. So let's take to fly. Actually, no, that, that's going to be regular. Hold on. Uh, to swim. Swim is, a, is one of these that's confusing. Swim. Simple past. Swam. Present participle. Swimming. Is this one of those examples? To Google. There we go. Okay, that is correct. You're probably not going to see a lot of people use the term swum, but that is actually uh, a way that this verb is supposed to be conjugated. So sometimes it's just going to be the same kind of ed ending. Those are more regular verbs. Those are more typical. But sometimes you, you get to do some funky stuff. You'll notice also that with swim, you're changing the vowel from one form to another, which is another sign of an irregular verb, something that's uh, just going to require some memorization because English is cobbled together from so many different languages. So in order to get verb tenses, we need to take these different versions of the verb and combine them in various ways. So, um, let's create a table. Want it to be like this? Yeah, we want it to be that big. Okay. And I'm going to write some words here. Oh, very cool. It's uh, straddling the page. There we go. Okay. So when we talk about verb tenses, we can just talk about past tense, present tense, future tense, but there are also some different uh, adjectives we can describe it with. Um, and so I'm going to describe those now. So we'll start with past, present, future, because those are simpler. Past tense, it happened before now. Present tense, it is happening now. Future, it will happen. And we can already start to see some patterns emerging there in the way that we're using those verbs. But then we'll also talk about simple, um, which probably doesn't need too much of an explanation. We'll see it's just, you know, the simplest way the verb can work. But perfect and progressive add a couple of extra little bits of information. So perfect is it happened just before the time we are talking about. And this will make more sense when I start putting verbs into this. And progressive is it is happening throughout, or sorry, it's is continuing to happen before, during, and after the moment being talked about. So simple past, let's just take call again. So this would be, I called him. We're just taking the simple past form, dropping it there, calling it a day. Nothing super complicated there. Then simple present, same deal. I call him. Because we're taking simple present and just plugging it in. Those two are simple. <laughs> Future though, Hold up. 
but we don't have a future principal part of the verb. And so what we do is we add a helping verb, will. So this becomes, I will call him. And that's how we get the future tense pretty much every time. Just add the word will. Okay, a little far, a little far. There we go. We're going to need a little bit more room for these. So this verb tense we accomplish using this helping verb. Um, and so let's get the construction here really quickly. Stop capitalizing. Thank you. So the simple future tense is formed by taking the simple the uh, simple present and just tacking will to the beginning of it. Now let's get to the perfect tense. So this is, it happened just before the time that we're talking about, remember. So we're talking about the past, but it's not just I called him, it's I had to call to him. Because now, the moment that we're talking about is still later than when the call had happened. So we get the perfect tense by tacking on a form of to have, and then the simple past. Had called. Is that simple past? Actually, no, wait. This is going to be simple past participle. Sorry about that. Past participle. Because uh, in the case where it's called, like it's going to be the same. But if we were using swim, so I, I had, it would be I had swum, not I had swam. So, sorry about that. Past participle form there, but it is still simple present form for the future tense. I was correct on that. So, I had called him. Then, with the present perfect tense, I have called him. So, actually, yeah, yeah, okay. So here, it's going to be, because it's in the past, it was had. If it's in the present, it's going to be have. But we're still in the past participle, because again, this is something that's going to be, have happened before the moment we're talking about. And so then for future perfect, we combine all of this together, and we will say, I will have called him. So there's some point in the future we're talking about, and while we haven't called them yet... By that time, we will have called him. And that's your future perfect. Progressive is going to switch it up and put us into the present participle form. So now we have... Um, I... This is past progressive. I believe we need a form of to be as well. Yes, we do. Um, so, I was calling him. So, the progressive tense we get from a form of to be plus present participle form. And we get our tense Pre, you know, past, present, perfect, from that form of to be. So I was calling him, I am calling him, and then I will be calling him. So this is how we get all, all of our verb tenses, except there's one more that we haven't talked about. It's just the granddaddy of all of them.
we can combine these two together. So we get, let's say, future, present, progressive tense. I will have been calling him. We've got a you will, which makes it future. We've got a form of have followed by a past participle. And that past participle happens to be a form of to be, which is then followed by the present participle, the ing verb. English verb tense can get pretty complicated. So, I'll, I'll leave you guys to work out what you think the, uh, the past and present, pa pre or, uh, they said, why did I say present? Perfect progressive. I am so sorry that that was that confusing. It's still confusing, but it, it, it was worse because of what I had. So this is the future, the, uh, future perfect progressive tense. I'll leave you to figure out the past and present perfect progressive tenses. <laughs> that makes so much more sense. I'm glad that someone thinks so. Alrighty, alrighty. So scrolling back up here, because we were talking about verbals before, um, you can't just stick anything into, you know, any kind of verb here and make a gerund. It's going to be the present participle form. You couldn't say, for example, ridden a bike is difficult. Ridden would be your past participle here. Doesn't fit. Needs to be the, the present participle form. Present participle is your ing verb. Um, then with the infinitive form, that's one of the principal parts to ride. You know, and people would say pr a principal part would be... Um, uh, that infinitive wouldn't be a principal part, that the infinitive is more of a, a uh, not a tense exactly, but a, I don't know what you would call it exactly, but it uses the, the simple past, but it has the word to before it. So infinitives are really easy to spot out of all the verbals because it's the word to followed by a verb. It's pretty hard to, to miss that combination of things if you know that rule. Then participles, hmm... Hmm. Wonder why they're called that. Um. Uh. Anchored by the slaying of his comrade through his hammer. Um. So here we have multiple of these, actually. So we've got... Let's go and just find our verbs first. That's always the first step that I would say to do when breaking down a sentence. Verb here, verb here, verb here. So we've got three verbs. Through has a clear subject in Thor. He's the one who's doing the throwing. Hammer is going to be the direct object there. Angered would love to have its subject be Thor, but Thor is already taken. So it has to be a verbal. And what this ends up being is a participial phrase modifying Thor. So remember, this is acting as an adjective every time. That's what participles do. Oops. Well, we'll scroll back down and get that in the right place. Remember, they're used as adjectives. And here. There. We got it. Um, and then we have this preposition by, which is a hint here, because then we end up having multiple prepositional phrases of his comrade is all describing slaying. And that's pretty standard. Comrade is just a noun. So that's going to be an object of a preposition, but then slaying is a verb. But we can see here pretty clearly that it's getting treated as a noun because slaying is the object of the preposition. So 
we just decide, well, wait, this is a verb in present participle form doing a thing that a noun usually does. It's a gerund. And so it's serving as the object of one preposition, and it's being modified by this prepositional phrase, which we can describe as adjectival because it's describing this. Remember, prepositional phrases turn nouns into modifiers. So that's how you would break that whole thing down. So you've all, you've all got that now, right? You could totally just break a sentence down. And, you, you, and you know, if you, if you remember all of the things that I just told you, and you could execute them perfectly, then you can break down pretty much any sentence you want to look for. Um, there are a few cases where certain words might be a little bit confusing, like the ways that certain words can be used can be challenging. But you've got all you need. That's all of English syntax right there. We just went through it. Took us, what, three hours? Yeah. So, I mean, that's not one class period, but that's like a week's worth of class periods. It's the practice that takes all of the extra time and the classroom management. Shout out to two. Yeah, it does a lot of work. It can be a preposition or it can be part of an infinitive. Got a couple of different roles there. No, it's two class periods. High school sucks. Oh, no, you've got block classes. Uh, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, let's see. Somebody, somebody give me a sentence. Like, just try and give me something that's complex and we'll try and break it down. Some, something you want me to show you the syntax of. I ask this as a person who teaches math and I get this question a lot. Why does all this matter? So, if you're just speaking the language, it can definitely help you understand why certain things sound right to, say, a native English speaker. Um, to, to actually have the rule behind it is what backs that up um, to decide whether or not you should say something a certain way. But where it really starts to matter is in situations where the way that something is worded is very important. For example, in a law, they might actually bring out a linguist to interpret the law to make sure that you understand, like, here is what the law is actually dictating. Here's what we need to do. Um, because there are some cases where it could be worded ambiguously. Um, there are some cases where it's worded in such a complex way that it's difficult to understand what they're trying to say. Uh, knowing this sort of thing actually helped a lot with deciphering more archaic that is written in ways that are maybe different from the way that we currently would. Ooh, I'm dropping frames. We back? Okay, we should be back now. Sorry, we're dropping frames. Uh, it can help it with deciphering language that's older uh, because when people stray away from the, the kinds of constructions that people tend to make these days, um, it can help to have this background so that you can parse it out for yourself. Um, this actually helped a ton with understanding Shakespeare, for example. Uh, Charles Dickens is another. He makes really, really complicated sentence structures. Like, you can read an entire paragraph, and that's just one sentence of Dickens. And being able to track, okay, wait, this verb has this as the subject, and this is the object. Okay, and then and then these are all just modified. Okay, 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 okay. And then here's the next clause, and here's the next clause. And being able to bracket those off properly can really help with uh, comprehension sometimes. Um, for the most part, people probably don't need to know all of these things, at least by name. But this is the logic that the language is built on. And if we're going to have any kind of discussion of language, then it's important to understand these aspects so that we can discuss that. Okay, um, ha, okay, all right, I see you, Zoomer. All right, this is actually a pretty good one here. So, according to... This is a phrase that tends to kind of just get lumped into, like, <sighs> according to. Let's break this down as a participial phrase. So, 
according um do we want to call it a participial phrase yes we want to call it a participial phrase okay um so according is a verb that's sitting out here without a subject so then to and of aviation okay so th these are just prep phrases um i'm not going to break those down too heavily here but you know object of the preposition here object of the preposition here modifier modifier of aviation is adjectival and it's modifying laws and then to all known laws of aviation is adverbial and it's modifying according so So this, actually, this is being a sentential adverb. So maybe we need to consider, according to, maybe we need to consider according to to be a subordinating conjunction. I'm going to go look up according to right here and see what the general consensus is. According to part, er, part of, we'll say part of speech. That's probably how they'll talk about it here. They call it a preposition in the Macmillan Dictionary. Interesting. Classifies according as a preposition with two. Okay. They call it a preposition. There are a couple of these phrases that we know how they work, but fitting them into the logic of what we've talked about can be a little bit tricky. Okay, so according to, we're going to call a preposition. So, that's a prep. Then laws would be the OP. All known. Of is preposition. Aviation's OP. Of aviation, modifying laws. According to all known laws of aviation is an adverbial prep phrase modifying the main verb is then there is going to be our subject for this sentence it's just an empty kind of dummy subject for this sort of construction and then way is going to be a predicate nominative no is going to be an adjective modifier that is a relative pronoun. It's antecedent being way. So way, a B should be able to fly. Um, there is no way that a B should be able to fly. Um, and that is serving as a bridge between this word here and this clause which is a bee should be able to fly. B is our subject. Should is a helping verb. B is a uh, helping verb here. Actually, no, it's a linking verb. What am I saying? I'll back that up because able is not a verb. Able is an adjective. Linking verb. So the B is able, predicate adjective. And then to fly... Actually, able to might be another one of those constructions again. Able. Yeah, able to actually might be. What kind, to what extent able? It feels like it would be adverbial. Oh, wait. That's, that's because it can be. Oh, my God. I am missing something here. Forgot a part. Infinitives can be adverbial too. I'm glad we caught that. Sometimes examples show those. So there's infinitive phrase. And it's adverbial because um, 
we're modifying able, which is a, the adjective that B is being attached to. There. Super simple. <laughs> that is actually a really good uh, sentence to break down, though, to show kind of how this works. Uh, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do the buffalo one, actually. Because now that we can break sentences down, we can explain how this... Buffalo, buffalo. Buffalo, buffalo. The capitalization is important, actually. Buffalo, buffalo, buffalo. Um, buffalo, 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 buffalo. Okay. So, <laughs> we're working with several different uh, definitions of buffalo here. So, the first one, the one that's capitalized in all of these cases, is Buffalo, New York. So this is being used as an adjective. What kind of buffalo? The buffalo that are from Buffalo, New York. Then we've got buffalo, the, uh, uh, the noun, the animal. And then we've got buffalo, which is... A verb, which means, I believe, to bully or to beat up or something. We need um, buffalo verb. Um, oh, no, I'm wrong. Um, it is to confuse. Given all of these different definitions... Here's what we can piece together. We have buffalo, buffalo. So this is noun, adjective. So this is a buffalo from buffalo. They buffalo. So this is the verb. This is confuse. Buffalo, buffalo. So this is, again, adjective, noun. And then from here, there is a subordinate clause. Buffalo, buffalo, buffalo. Um, adjective, noun, verb. Um, where, so we're saying that buffalo, buffalo confuse the buffalo, buffalo that the buffalo buffalo we were already talking about before confuse they confuse the ones that they confuse is what we're saying here um so this buffalo uh the buffalo 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 is an adjective clause modifying the fifth buffalo <laughs> so that's how we're able to get away with that um it would also you know if it helps you to think about it you can put the word that in here. Buffalo, 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 that, buffalo, buffalo, buffalo. It doesn't sound any better when I say it that way, but it might help with reading it and understanding it. That's how that all works. So this is, in fact, a dating advice, loosely speaking. I, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can, you can, if you know the language pretty well, then you can write poetry. And poetry is romantic. <laughs> um, uh, da -da 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 -da. The able is usually a verb that takes an infinitive as a complement. Interesting, okay. Yeah, there, there are some classifications where, like, for very simple words that you look at and you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't fit into the the usual mold that I'm, I'm used to teaching. Hey, Jem, do you think I'm going to pass my AP Physics 1 exam tomorrow? Probably, yeah. Um... 
thing with it with the phys the AP exams is that they're normed to how everybody else does on them. Like you can get a five on an AP exam and have it be like a sixty percent. Um, yeah, there's a town called Buffalo in New York. Uh, it gets really, really high snowfall. Like people there need to build their buildings stronger because it literally needs to withstand like seven foot snowfalls. Um, anytime you hear about snowfall anywhere in the country, it's going to be the worst in Buffalo, New York. I don't know why people live there. <laughs> it's, it seems really difficult. Like you're, you're going to get snowed in frequently living there. So it's like police, 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 police. I think you can only have five because police can't be an adjective, really. Unless like, what is a police police? Is that, like, someone who is more police-like than other policemen are? I don't know. I, I, it would have to just be five. Police, 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 that police, police. I feel like that's as far as you can go with that one. The police, the police, the others. Yeah, you can only have five, I think. The police, that police, the police. Police, the police. That's a, a good way to break it down. Oh, the police police. So the police who are policing the police. Okay. So police, 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 police. That would give you seven. Yeah. That would be, yeah, that's syntactically accurate. I don't know that there's any group of people called the police police, but if there were, then that would work. Um... Let me think. I've been str always struggled with the difference between complex compound and compound complex. What that's, what's that about? Oh, uh, we can go back up to clauses and talk about that. Um, that's not something we talked about because I don't know why you would ever need to label the sentences that way, but here, where'd we get? Uh, there we go. Okay, so remember, independent clauses, dependent clauses. So let's scroll down to just before verbals and just put some space there so you've got compound sentences complex sentences compound complex sentences and simple sentences uh, I have actually taught this before like it was on tests because they told me I had to teach it. I really don't see much of a point in knowing this unless you're trying to like, I guess maybe you're doing a linguistic study of the kinds of language that people use. Like you're trying to analyze someone's work and saying they use a lot of say simple sentences or a lot of compound sentences or something like that to describe their linguistic style. Maybe you're breaking it down like it's music theory or something. I guess that could be a reason to have it, but it's definitely not super useful to the layman. But a simple sentence is one independent clause. Compound sentences are two or more independent clauses. Zero dependent. It's actually almost use more useful to put this in a table, actually. I think I'll do that. Uh, so we need label, and then we need number, and then, we, okay, yeah, this works. So number independent clauses, number dependent clauses. So we've got simple, compound, complex, compound, complex. And this is just a number. It does not need to be this big. Oh, let's go. We fit them both. Okay. So one, zero, two or more, zero. Complex, 
is only one independent clause, but one or more dependent clauses. And then compound complex is combining compound and complex together. So we end up with at least two independent clauses and at least one dependent clause. Why do we need to know these names? For the most part, we probably don't. But if you ever get quizzed on this sort of thing, this is what you're looking at. So in order to determine whether a sentence is compound or complex, one of the reasons that we, we probably have this in education is that it's actually really useful to quiz someone because figuring this stuff out means you need to break down the crap out of a sentence. So like, um, according to all known laws of aviation, uh, B, um, what was the... The full quotation. Uh, it was up a little higher. And it's going to be faster. Uh, God, everyone's typing this now. While I'm scrolled so far up that I'm never going to see it. Yeah, somebody probably typed it at this point. No? Shoot. Okay. Um... Doing a barrel roll. Fox McCloud saved Slippy for the millionth time because Slippy is a bad pilot. Okay. So this is a little bit tricky because I've given myself a participial phrase here. So this is not a clause. This is just a modifier. We've got main verb there, saved slippy, slippy's do, fox's subject. For the millionth time is all just prep phrase on saved. And then we've got, okay, so this is one in, uh, independent clause with one subordinate clause because because is a subordinating conjunction. And then we've got clause in there. So this means we have one independent clause, only one. So we can't have the word compound in the name. And then we do have a subordinate clause. We have that subordinating conjunction introducing it there. So we cannot have it be simple. It must be complex. And being able to do all of that reasoning makes you have to learn all of the other stuff, which I feel is a reason that a lot of people keep it around is something that they teach because it makes for a good test question that's really good at actually helping you, you know, forcing you to figure out how this sentence is actually put together. Forgot Slippy was an actual character and not the icon for a male <laughs> that played Melee Mod. <laughs> True. He's, he's, I wouldn't say he's forgettable if you've played the games, because again, he's the most useless character I've ever seen. He is just always needing help. He, while he's in combat any, at any rate, he never provides anything. I think he's supposed to be like a, an inventor or something. And so he's like an engineer tinkering and so you put up with his bad flying skills because he's building stuff for you. I think that's how that works. But yeah, I, when you're actually playing the game, it's just like every time you hear from Slippy, it's just, Fox, Fox, help me! <sighs> Boy, they. He's, 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 he's up there with like Navi in terms of annoying N64 characters. I asked my brother about diagramming sentences earlier, and he said that when his teachers tried connecting it to math, it just made it even harder. That's not a good idea. I would not connect it to math. Um, diagramming sentences is like a fun little puzzle, but the thing that I've come to terms with over time is that it's basically just teaching you extra steps to learn the same things you could learn by just parsing it. Um, Parsing is what I've been doing by writing out the sentence, like writing, here's the main verb, here's the subject, here's how all this connects. Like, you don't have to draw extra, you don't have to learn how the shapes are made to figure out how it's diagrammed. Like, you can just look at the sentence and, like, draw brackets and stuff and break it down that way. And so I've tended not to teach it myself, even though I actually know two different ways of doing that. Preamble to the U.S. Constitution. Oh, my God, isn't that... Uh, 
Oh boy. We're gonna need to make this a bigger font. Um, you know, this actually isn't that bad now that I'm looking at it. It's it's long, but a lot of this is not gonna be super complex. So, so we there should should be a comma here actually. <laughs> we the people of the United States. So people of the United States. This is what's called an appositive, which is something that I I'm glad we talked about here because I forgot to mention that earlier. Uh, this is literally just a noun that renames another noun. Like, um, Joey, my son. Romeo, my cat. It's just like, if someone's like, wait, who the heck is Romeo? You you clarify by adding extra information after that. So, we, oink. all of this is just in a positive phrase. APP. People is the actual positive. The is a modifier on that, as is of the United States. Of the United States being a prep phrase. United States being the object of the preposition. It's a proper noun, um, so you, you can have the two words being combined there. But strictly speaking, if you wanted to break it down, united is a modifier on states within the name. And then the is modifying the United States. Uh, so, and then people, or we, actually we're probably going to say we here is the subject. It, uh, and the main verb for this doesn't come in until ordain and establish. So ordain and establish are allowed to both be the main verb because they have the conjunction and that's making it so that they can both be slotted into the same spot in the sentence. Do is going to be a helping verb there. Do ordain and establish. Constitution is direct object. This is modifying constitution. Uh, this is a demonstrative pronoun, which is a type of pronoun we didn't talk about. Um, a demonstrative pronoun is where you're demonstrating what it is you're talking about. So it doesn't need an antecedent because you're already like pointing to it or referring to, you know, the document itself in this case. So like if I say this water bottle, you don't need an antecedent in the language I've talked about earlier because I literally just pointed to it and like showed you. Um, so you're, I'm demonstrating in order to give you the antecedent. That's what that means. Uh, and then for the United States of America is another prep phrase, which is, you know, you can put that on ordain and establish. It's kind of modifying both. Um, the United States of America, which states United Ones, on America there. And then literally everything else in here is verb phrases. So in order to... In order to is basically just a subordinated conjunction here. We'll call it that. You could go further to say that in order is a prep phrase followed by to as a complement, I guess. Um, but then form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure, provide, promote, sec and secure. And then all of those verb phrases are just like, maybe, hold on, in order to, well, actually, no, wait, these have got to be, hmm, in order to form, to ensure. Uh, I'd have to look up exactly what in order to is going to be used for, but like you can see that the rest of this breaks down pretty simply. Form, union, establish justice, ensure tranquility, provide for so the prep phrase, promote welfare, secure blessings to, and so lots of prep phrases and stuff. Um, so there's a lot of like repetition there. It's just that one construction that I'm not completely sure about. Um, in order to syntax, let's look that up real quick. Clear all of that. In order to, with an infinitive form of a verb to express the purpose of something, introduces a subordinate clause. Okay. So we'd call 
all of this, one subordinate clause, um, and this would be functioning as a sentential at, okay. Um, so there's this thing called a sentential adverb that uh, it's a really specific thing, which is why I didn't bring it up in the adverbs section. But we can go up here and we can fill that in real quick. Uh, here we go. So, normally with adverbs, you're going to put them like right with the, the word that they're modifying, right? Um, so, I ate a donut yesterday was, is the more common construction here. But if you want to lead with it, oh, very cool. Thank you for doing that. If you want to lead with it, you're also allowed to do that and just stick it at the beginning of the sentence. And so my understanding here is that what we would probably do today is to put all of this stuff before we get to the main clause. So in order to do all of these things, we do ordain this constitution. That's probably the, the more modern way to put it. But things were less standardized at the time that this was written, um, which is why, for example, in a lot of official writing from, you know, the, the early days of the United States, you'll see words being seemingly misspelled. Um, a lot of that is because, like, the dictionary was not as, you know, when, when was the original dictionary? Um, hello. Um... First English dictionary would have been, oh, interesting, 1604. It's the first single language English dictionary ever published. That's a lot earlier than I thought it was. Um, but even so, you know, around this time, it's a lot less standardized. So you're going to see some different spellings and some archaic spellings and things like that. And you can also do that with word order. But I think there's also a certain aesthetic purpose to be putting this out at the beginning. Um, like I said before, you know, I don't prescribe that this is the, you know, this putting the sentential adverb at the beginning is the way you have to do it if it's understandable. And I think here it, it makes a good point that you are being addressed here, Mr. Mr. King of England, by we the people of the United States. So this larger group of people and... We're asserting that we have this new identity relative to you. That was an important thing for them to establish. Like, the very beginning of... Or actually, this is the Constitution, right? Yeah, okay. Well, it's a new country, and... When was the Constitution actually put together? I think this was actually well after the war had been won. So never mind. I was thinking of the Declaration of Independence. Um, screwed up my history there. But... Uh, one of the things, okay, so the context is actually that this is a governing document, which also makes sense. Um, this is um, stating that this government is being drawn up not by, like, one ruler, but by a group of people. Oh, admittedly, wealthy white men, and they, that was a part that they kind of leave out of that. But um, it was at least with the intention of being democratic that people were going to be running the show. So I think it made sense to emphasize that that is the important part of the very beginning. Um, and it's kind of iconic for doing so. So there's the preamble to the Constitution. Is this going to be on the Splatoon final this week? This is like a filibuster for Splatoon Senate. <laughs> All right. Please edit this down into a video. I would love to watch this, but the last time I sleep now. Uh, the, the video will go up as uh, the live. Um, like, if you go... I, heck, I've got the, the thing open right now. Might as well... I don't know what it's going to recommend on this channel, but this channel is mine. No, not this. I clicked the wrong thing. 
it should be okay so when you go here to the channel page and you click on live you can see the vods of past streams and it goes back pretty far considerably further than uh does it just have all of them from all time that's crazy that they let that much be on the site um but yeah you can just go back and and watch it in its entirety even if it doesn't get made into an edited video because honestly i think it takes about that long to explain like i don't think that whoa that's not what we're trying to show we're trying to show did i x out of it i think i just x out of it well poo um where'd you go where'd you go it's gone i killed the word document i'm sorry everybody I know you care deeply about it. Um, here we go, here we go, here we go. I've got it back. I saved it. I saved it. It's saved. It lives. Not the Word document funeral next monday yeah no i lied it lives um so yeah like that's not a bad example but going back to my point i, I think like i really couldn't have gone through that like with much less filler like most of that was actually pretty necessary it did take about that long and so I figure the best way to get this information is just to kind of watch through it from the beginning. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I used to teach. You know, it's something that I uh, built into my content to some degree in every year that I ever taught English. Let me post the Word document in the Discord. Um, I could do that. I could... Uh, I'll go and uh, get it cleaned up a little bit, and then uh, I can post it there. What do you mean by syntax? How is it the same different from the general idea of grammar? Syntax is word order and the ways that words function specifically. Um, that was a topic that I discussed earlier on, like v right at the beginning. Because like, so this is this is an outline of the talk that I gave, right? So I started here talking about a few things that we need to talk about before we get into syntax. And then syntax is really what this whole lecture was about. Um, and I give a definition of that at the beginning of it all. So if there's questions about like any of this stuff, it has all been covered already in the talk that I gave previously. Wow, Jim, you're so good at teaching. You should become a teacher. <laughs> I did become a teacher and... Uh, First year I did that was the worst year of my life. It was absolutely miserable. It got better after that, but uh, I was still working entirely too long. What's the difference between its and its? Good question. Let's go down and talk about that. Um, so this is contractions, first of all, are where we're lazy and don't want to say extra syllables so we replace them with an apostrophe now if you just did this everywhere it would be confusing so there are certain words and phrases that are very common that people do this with because they're things that we just have to say all the time um, so we see we are and do not which would be spelled out as we are and do not for the purposes of breaking this sentence down. It's is a possessive pronoun. We talked about those up in the pronoun chart earlier. It is here. Uh, there. It is a singular third-person possessive pronoun. 
in the neuter gender. So when we're talking about its, we're talking about something that we would call it owning a thing. It's with an apostrophe is a contraction of it is. So the cow, oops, the cow ate its oats. Here, this needs to have no apostrophe because it's a possessive pronoun. The cow owns the oats. It's a modifier modifying oats in that way. Whereas, here, this is meant to be understood as it is. Cow ate oats, and now it is full. Not neutered, neuter. Um, neuter is essentially a word that means to make genderless, or make sexless, I guess, would be a better word for it. Um, so when you, when you neuter a dog, you are... Let's not talk about that part of it. Um, neuter just means, in the, the case of, like, grammar, that we are removing any concept of gender from it. You don't talk about the gender of a rock. Okay, rocks do not have genders, as far as I'm aware. I, I don't see any societal expectations being built up around them. You know, I don't see particular roles that rocks are meant to play that are different. They're just... You know, inanimate objects in that case. We don't attribute a concept of gender to them. Um, we often use neuter pronouns to refer to animals, although um, it's probably, you know, more, I guess, empathetic to refer to them with pronouns that don't classify them as objects. Um, it was just the first example that came to mind, and I was trying to stay in keeping with the cow. Pro chara short for pronoun chart. <laughs> That's funny. Who's advent? Yeah. Um, don't do that, please. Syllabant. Yeah. Um, and you know all all of those those jokes like. Um, those are based on contractions. Dislike, likened. What about the proper possessive that, that uses an apostrophe? Uh, correct. And there it's just ambiguous. Um, you have to look at the context of the sentence to figure that out. So, for example, I stream sniped. Gems game. Here, you know, if you just look at gems, you're not really sure. But once you see this sentence, you're like, okay, we'll, we'll just put these together as one word. Um, here, it does not make any sense to say, I stream sniped gem is game. Those don't... We know just from looking at the sentence, this has to be possessive. And so that's how we avoid ambiguity with that particular construction of apostrophes. Question about contractions. Do you know how common or standard it is to use multiple contractions like who'd have? Um, the, who'd have, any contractions are generally informal. Um, typically, you know, if you're really trying to write to, you know, a very important purpose, um, you typically won't actually see contractions. You will often see people actually just write out do not. Um, that's, ex ex that's excessively formal for most situations, but it is, you know, if you're really trying to be as formal as possible, just avoid contractions entirely. Um, and that'll make it the most easy for people to understand. So who would have, I mean, that's something people will understand, but 
Also, for a new language learner who shows up and sees that crap on their page, they're going to be like, what am I looking at, dude? Would you write his is? No, because his is fundamentally a possessive pronoun. Um, like, we, we go up into the pronoun chart and find it in the possessive category and no place else. You would just say that thing is his. Or, that is his thing. What about plural possessive nouns? Um, oh, okay, so like... I... The boys' team, let's say, won the game. So the team that is owned by the boys. Here, you put the apostrophe at the end of it. Because if you put the apostrophe here, it is understood that there is one boy who owns this team. But if you put it here, it is understood that there are multiple boys who own this team. What about dashes? Dashes are pretty nebulous. There are a lot of different reasons that people use dashes. Um, it kind of just indicates a pause that can be a comma kind of pause. Some people use them like periods. Some th people use them for parentheticals or a positives. Um, it's a punctuation that defies prescriptivist thought. Um, like, you look at the way that, like, Emily Dickinson uses, I think it's Emily Dickinson, uses dashes, and it's just like, man, what are the rules here? Like, dash here, dash here, dash here. It's, it's almost like it's dictating the metric cadence, that it's nothing to do with the syntax and everything to do with how it should be read out loud. But, like, she just kind of she just kind of throws those in here. And, like, she's Emily Dickinson. Who are you to tell her no? Um, so dashes are a lot more, I think, are open to artistic interpretation. Um, I would say it, they could fill in a place where... You might use a semicolon. They could fill in in a place where you might use a comma. They could fill in in a place where you might use parentheses or where you just might have in a positive phrase. Um, those are probably the main places where I would see it used. Can we talk about why hyphens are used in some words? Are they for compound nouns? Um, hyphens basically create a greater level of connection between two words that are not recognized as a compound noun. Um, so like fire truck, you wouldn't hyphenate that, but like half lived, half truck, half something, you would put a hyphen in there um, because it's like, Becoming a part of the noun a little bit. What is the difference between cannot and can not? Um, you generally just use cannot. Um, unless the not is modifying another net, another verb. I can't think of a reason why, why you would use can and not. Does that get flagged? It doesn't get flagged. Maybe they're both acceptable. Usually just see that. Except that everyone writes can't anyway. What about names that end with S like Bellos? There you typically will... Um, like it's, it's... You might see just an apostrophe at the end of that. And then you just have to know, because it's a proper noun, understand that it's singular. Um, 
but like I've seen some people decide to use the apostrophe S. I think it kind of just depends on how the person wants to use the name, but um, there's probably a more official ruling on that that I'm not perfectly aware of at the moment. Um, is there an agreement on the proper way to write proper possessive nouns that end in S, like Charles is versus Charles? Yeah, that was a question that just got asked. Always write apostrophe S unless it's following a plural noun. Yeah, okay. I've always been confused about, confused about laid, lay, lane, lie, etc. Oh, those, we actually talked about that. Um, let's go back up to that real quick for your benefit. This is all to do with the principal parts of the verb. Um, so with irregular verbs, you might have four different versions of all of this. So simple present for, we'll, we'll go through lay and put them all out here. So simple present lay, simple past would be, um, or no, it would be lie, sorry. Then there's lay, then there's, To lie, to, to wait, to lay, are we talking to lay down or to lie? Because those are actually two different words. We'll, we'll say that it's lay, laid, laying, and lane. And then lie, um, I don't remember exactly how this one breaks down. I think. Lay it down, laying down. I think lie goes to lay. And then the present participle is lying. And then the past participle. Had lane. That one I don't actually know all the way. Um, principal parts lie. So it's lie, lay, lane, and lying. Oh, that's actually no. I got it right. Lane, lie, because they did did it in a different order. Lie, lane. So it's also lane. So what's lay then? Uh, is it not a different word? Because you can lay something down, and that's different from lie. Laid, laying. Okay, so lay, laid serves both roles. Okay, so it's regular. So lay, it would be lay, laid, laying, and laid. And then lie has, okay, that's how that works. So these are two different words, first of all. To lay something down is to like put it down yourself. To lie down is to put yourself on the ground. Um, or to tell a lie, which I think breaks down. Uh, actually, no, that would be lied. So the, the different, different, forget that part of it. Um, so lay has, this is its simple present. This is its simple past. This is its present participle. This is its past participle. And the way that you get... Verb, tense, verb tenses out of that is by following these patterns here, where, um, so like the simple past would be, um, let, let's just use it as a, a, an intransitive verb, no object here. So it'd be, I, I laid, I lie, I will lie. Uh, or, laid, sorry. Um, I laid, I lay, I will lay. So this would probably actually be transitive, um, but we'll forget about that for a second. Then past perfect would be, I had laid. Present perfect would be, I have laid. Future perfect will be, I will have laid. Um, and then past progressive would be, I was laying. Present would be, I am laying. I will be laying. Um, then for lie, which is a different word, 
We have I lied. I lie. I will lie. We have I had lied. Or wait a minute, no, I'm I'm talking about the wrong kind of lying. Uh, lane. Uh, I had lane. I have lane. I will have lane. Then progressive. I was was laying. Was lying. Sorry. Um, I am lying, and I will be lying. And all of this changes if we're saying lie as in to tell falsehood, because then it's just I lied. And it becomes lie, lied, lying, and lied. So yeah, that is that is confusing, because we kind of have too many words that are too similar there, and they all have different principal parts. How necessary are commas between adjectives all describing the same noun? Because mathematicians are allergic to them. This is actually, uh, it depends on the situation. So, um, they're all adv modifying the same thing. So, let's look at this phrase here, the best red truck. In this case, red truck, need, or actually, okay, the best red um, pickup truck, let's say. Er, uh, Um, trying to think of something that's not a compound down here. Uh, there. Let's try it with this. Actually, we'll just say salt water. So, here, we really don't want commas. Salt water is modifying fish, yes, but we also definitely need red to be modifying fish in the same way, because, like, if we put separation between them, the best red salt water fish, we're not creating the hierarchy that needs to be there. These two adjectives need to be closer to the, the noun than this one does because it's the best specifically fish that is red and salt water. So if you put commas, it makes it so that the relationship between these adjectives and their noun are understood the same way as all of these. And so what we're saying here, if we just put commas, is that it is the best fish. But it's not. It's the best fish that is red and salt water. So we've got to uh, actually not put the commas there. There, there are different situations depending on what you've got there. Um, if it's just like the silly red goofy fish, or um, um, sparkly fish. Now, you know, the silly fish, the red fish, the sparkly fish, they're all kind of on the same level. We're understanding that all of those are connected to fish in the same way as each other. And so there, you know, we can just separate them all together like that with a comma. But it does depend on the situation.
I don't know the actual answer about octopus is plural. So octopus is plural. There is, you'll see in dictionaries that octopi, octopuses, and octopodes are all accepted. Because um, you're going to hear all three of those. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, because octopus comes from Greek, that if you were to, you know, transition it from the Greek, that podes should actually be correct, because that's the way that it would be pluralized. But man, I don't care. I know what you're talking about. Everyone knows what you're talking about. It's not that important. How do you write an entire essay on the Shawshank Redemption? I can write an essay on a, on a single scene of the Shawshank Redemption. It's, it's a major work of fiction. Like, there's a lot to look into there. You could talk about the cinematography of one scene in an essay. Do you use the Oxford comma? The Oxford comma is usually good. There are some very rare situations where the Oxford comma is actually more confusing. Um, but you're very unlikely to come up with those because you're going to speak English like a normal person. And you're probably not going to list that many things in a row to where you will actually need that many, you know, that specific of comma usage. Octopeds, which includes spiders. Now that's a different word. <laughs> now we're getting into completely different meaning here. <laughs> Splatoon essay? I mean, I I could write an essay on the uh, North American localization of Octo Expansion and its introduction of race relations and the, you know, the, the cultural changing of it um, based on the way that the translation worked in Japanese versus the way that it worked in North America. Like, I could get get that granular on it. There's a lot to say about anything. In fact, that like if you go in and, and do like graduate study, that's what you're going to be looking at. You're going to be looking at the tiniest, tiniest, thinnest slice of knowledge that there is, because it takes for a person to dig that deep and get that specific before they can actually claim to be an expert on anything. There is just too much to know. I'd watch that video essay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, there are probably a lot of people who would. Um, Rasicus did a good video explaining the differences in the translation. Um, but there's definitely a more critical analysis to be made if someone were interested in doing so. I'm, I mean, I could. Um, I love how I cannot understand is what's on the... <laughs> is the one thing that's up on screen. That's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> I... I've been kicking around the idea for a long time of just making a more kind of English teacher focused kind of channel. It, it would be, it would be considerably more adult oriented and considerably more um, political and probably vulgar. Um, th there's a lot that would go into that. That um, th there are a lot of things that I want to teach that you're not allowed to teach in a public school and for good reason <laughs> um there are a lot of things that i think are out there that are cool but that require interfacing with something that a school teacher would balk at trying to introduce to a classroom um there 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 is really cool media out there that an english teacher can't go in and talk about in a public school because it has you know, violent or sexual content or involves hard, strong language or, you know, various other weird things that it could have about it that we kind of don't get to talk about as English teachers. And so we're forced to kind of stick to the classics, to the safe stuff. Um, and I think it would be really cool to get a channel out there where I talk about the weird stuff and break it down the way an English teacher would. Um, that's something that, like... I've, I've had the thought to do that for a long time. I even have some extra... Um, well, when I got the Squid School like animations and sound effects and stuff and the opening intro sequence made, um, I also had one made for this other channel that I've been thinking about 
getting going for some time now. Um, it's always difficult to start a new channel because you're starting from zero every time, no matter how popular you are. Um, but it's... I've, always, I've been thinking, like, is that something that I want to just, you know, take the risk and transition this channel over to? No, not transition, to, like, add on to this channel and just have it be a separate segment on the same channel? Do I want to make a new channel for that and start from zero and, you know, be spending a lot of time without making money for it? Um, it's, it's been a struggle to think about how to kickstart that, but... That's been a plan for longer than you you guys probably would think. You see the animation? Hey, I want to make a video about it eventually. Yeah. <laughs> New channel seems like a lot of work. The thing about it is that Splatoon content is a lot easier because I already have the visuals made for me by professional animators. All I have to do is play the game for five minutes, and now I've got five minutes of video B-roll. Um... When I'm making something like a video essay, every image needs to be more carefully thought out, and that exponentially increases the amount of time that it takes to put out a video. Um, that's one of the challenges that I, I'm faced with. Like, I'm just going to spend so much more time clicking on colored rectangles than I have to with Splatoon, because with Splatoon, I can just play Splatoon, and that's the visual, and that takes so much time out of the workflow. Um... So it would be something that I'd have to get used to. There, There is the option of hiring an editor, but I am not wealthy enough to do that yet. Have some, an example of something you'd want to discuss if you've got a second channel running. Um, so there are certain topics that I'd like to talk about. Um, things like, um, I don't think it's a good idea to pursue being valedictorian. I don't think that that's as valuable a goal as something else you could be doing. Um, so advice from that perspective. Um, it, some of it could look pretty similar to Squid School, like some of it would be pretty mild. But then I would also talk about media that you can't touch as a public school teacher. Like, for the longest time, I have wanted to do a breakdown of Moo by Doja Cat. Because I think that is actually an insanely smart piece of art. But there's, there's just like giant anime boobs bouncing in the background for like the entire runtime of that music video, right? You cannot bring that into a classroom. <laughs> maybe in college, maybe there you could p p potentially get away with it. People would still look at you weird, right? But like, it's genius. And it, there's a reason that it went viral and made Doja Cat, you know, as, as popular and well-known and launched her pop career. Um, th there's a, a really weird music group called Clowncore, that I would love to introduce people to because I, I also think that they are brilliant. But there's a lot of like weird scatological humor in it, um, just very like juvenile, also kind of freaky to some people because it's scary clown stuff. Um, I'd like to get into the weird stuff and just English teacher the crap out of it all. Um, I, I could also, you know, th there's a lot to be said about politics and propaganda, like that you can't get into. Um, if I take, you know, a piece of propaganda from one party or another and analyze it and break down, here are the argumentative rhet rhetorical <laughs> techniques that are being used and, you know, maybe fact check where necessary, um, discuss the way that they're using um, those rhetorical devices to make arguments. Um, those are things that you often... You really need to let the students come to their own conclusions on those sorts of things, because otherwise it comes across as indoctrination. But, like, I could give analysis of that sort of stuff. Um, I ain't a moose, bitch. Get out my hay. Yeah, that, that is, it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like, I definitely think, like, I, I'm... I've been towing the, 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 the waters a little bit with this because, like, a lot of the content on Squid School has been very non-Splatoon for some time now. Um, it's been something that I've been thinking about, and I don't want to get rid of the Splatoon content or anything. It's just, for one thing, Splatoon content in general right now is becoming less profitable. Um, I'm, I'm still growing in terms of, like, subscriber count, but, like, let's just go to analytics real quick. Um, 
and let's kick this out for a year. This is what Splatoon did. Um, this right here is the period where the game launched. Like, uh, this moment right here is, like, September 9th or whatever, uh, which is when it came out. There it is. And so you can see what happened in the first, like, couple months. That is when this channel blew the heck up. Um, that's when this got way, way bigger. But you can see, like, once we hit, like, mid-October or so, this is probably a better indicator. Watch time is really more important. Um, like... It just starts slowly declining. And I, I, I used to look at, like, a bunch of uh, other YouTube channels and see, like, um, that they'd make gaming content for one game and then they'd switch to another game. And I always figured that that was just a matter of their interests changing or something. But realistically, I think it's actually just a good financial move sometimes because sometimes, like the game is petering out. You know, it's a commercial product. There are new products that are going to be coming out all the time and people are going to lose interest. And so this is kind of where we're at right now. Um, so I think, uh, I don't want to, you know, leave Splatoon or anything like that. You know, like there are some creators who just transition away from it and never look back. Um, I, I still think Splatoon is cool. I still want to be a part of the community and everything. I still want to get back to it. But I'm thinking, like, maybe it gets to a point where I can do, like, a video on each channel every other day. Like, a Splatoon video one day, then the next day it's a video on this new channel or something like that. Um, I don't know how, financi how financially viable that is because I get penalized like crazy every time, like, I don't upload on a day. Um, every time that has happened, there's been a really steep drop off in how much it gets recommended. And maybe, you know, it would take a process of retraining the algorithm. Uh, basically, I would be losing a lot of money during the time of that transition. But I think that um, one thing that, that's been, that I've been thinking about is that if I were to transition to that sort of thing, um, the other channel would have a wider appeal. Like there are a lot more people who are interested in the kind of stuff that I would be talking about there than there are people who play Splatoon competitively. Like, that's a pretty small subsection of the people who are on YouTube. Whereas people who speak English <laughs> and want to learn about things that are out there that are written in English, that's, that's a lot of people. And that would be a, a bigger audience that, you know, be more people that I could reach. So that's something that I've been thinking about, and I still have not come to solid conclusions on that. Um, but, you know, another thing is that I don't, I don't ever want to be stuck doing the same thing for a super long, long time unless I'm, you know, finding new things to do with it. Or I feel like the, worth, the work is consistently worth a lot to a lot of people. Um, and I don't think I'm, I'm past that with Splatoon or anything, but... Um, there will come a time where I'm, I'm like, man, there's not that much new to say about Splatoon at the moment. Like, there's not that much new that's that's happening. I feel like that does eventually happen. Um, and so maybe then I move on. I don't know. Remains to be seen. Um, I'm not trying to scare anybody, because like I said, I am still planning on sticking to Splatoon for the time being. But that is a thing. That is a thing that's going on. So that's a thing that's in my head. Going to start a Tears of the Kingdom channel. Man... I'm not particularly interested, I will say, in, like, tutorials or stuff for Tears of the Kingdom. Like, I'm not interested in becoming an expert for it. I would totally be down to do, like, a Let's Play sort of thing and just play through it. Um, but I don't know that I'd want to... I'd have a lot to say about it that I'm interested in saying. Um, what interests me right now is talking about more universal things than any one particular video game. Um... And it's always really been that way, because that's always what the videos have been about. They haven't just been about getting better at Splatoon. They've been get about getting better as people, because that's why I think getting better at Splatoon matters. Um, so. Anyway. Is that why you use shorts on non-video days? Yeah, you, you've got to have a daily upload. Otherwise, the algorithm is going to penalize you for it.
dating advice channel. <laughs> Just, just go <laughs> just commit to the bit no we're actually talking about dating now <laughs> oh man tinder profile stream when gem rates your tinder profile god i the problem with that is i'd get a bunch of like dating profiles from like people who are under 18 even though i'd ask for not that I could still advise, it would just be a little weird. Making a Tinder profile from me who's arrow ace. <laughs> Alright, look. I made the I made the joke about you looking at me smugly earlier. That means you're not allowed to look at me smugly now. I acknowledged it. <laughs> uh, is the YouTube algorithm like Clamblitz with the penalties? Uh y sure. It, it does it does penalize you, so I guess, yeah. Half the dating advice videos would be directly from the Splatoon videos. Yeah, it's like, treat other people as human beings. That's really the most important part there. And that's hard, because we're taught not to do that in very many ways. But, like, really, I think the biggest, most important thing with finding someone special is just getting back to that childlike state when you were like three first going to day daycare right first time ever seeing other human beings and you're just thinking and itemizing like okay what what are the differences between us my skin is this color but their skin is that color they have this kind of hair but i have this kind of hair and you know x y and z thing but you're like well we're just like playing with blocks together we're the same we have the same things that we like and if we can get back to that then if you can get back to that kind of empathy but on an adult level i don't see what's in your way all you got to do is find the right person and that's just a numbers game there's a lot that you can you know do in terms of what's culturally accepted understood what the norms are or everything but at the end of the day if you have empathy with the other person and you care about them enough to know their flaws but still care about them i don't know what else there is to say we can be epic friends now for real friends <laughs> who says i'm looking at you smugly Posts smug emoji. I think the key is actually not being ace, but okay. Yeah, if you're arrow ace, then yeah, I guess, I guess step one is having a romantic or physical interest in other people. That's important. We've got to give it, we've got to do that first. But then after that, <laughs> can we end with a Santa Claus? How's that? Alrighty. <clears throat> Yay, interjection. Excellent, excellent. We've been paying attention. <laughs> I am just confused about everything. I cannot understand. Well, I'm probably going to call it there. Um, I'm going to figure out something to make a video for. For Oh, God. I've got LTC coming up this weekend. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna level with you. I have no idea how I'm gonna get uploads for every day of that weekend between now and then. It's gonna have to be a bunch of shorts that I make tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I've done it before. We'll see if I can grind through it. Anyway, I'm gonna get offline and uh, figure out something for the night. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for indulging this this silly thing that I did that is uh, not a part of our regularly scheduled programming. We are going to go and raid Jazzicorn because more, more squid. More squid thing instead of whatever this was. <laughs> Y'all have a lovely day. And we're going to get going when that timer ticks down, whenever that ends up happening. All right, there we go. Have a good night, everybody.